family measurement of floor area ratio, where currently there is no measurement for floor area ratio in this plan district. In Old Town, we are reducing the process level for most signage from a process two for a process one to aid small businesses. And the last one requires ADA parking and loading spaces, even if no parking is required for multifamily residential uses in transit priority areas. As part of this amendment, we're also um, looking at the complete communities, housing solutions and mobility choices. We are, for the housing solutions, we're clarifying um, a rounding explanation and clarifying the trees and spacing requirement that already exists. We're adding more options for recreational amenities. We're reducing the highways, the distance from highways on sites with existing development. And under the mobility choices, we are clarifying the addition of vehicle miles travel reduction measures for developments that choose to provide excess parking. The next item is the removal of personal storage requirements for multifamily residential uses to facilitate housing development and reduce costs. Next is, al is allowing community gardens and open space zones and ensure they are designed, constructed, and maintained per the, pub the park and rec director. The allowance of balconies and as an architectural projection in all multifamily zones to provide for greater facade articulation. And lastly, for state law items, per Senate Bill 1383, we have to add the term organic material and regulate the amount of storage required for this additional bin to our existing refuse and recycling regulations. As well, outdoor lighting regulations um, are being aligned to comply with, uh, to be consistent with state law. As far as outreach, we held six two hour virtual public workshops in July and August to review the items and gather feedback on the draft language. Um, we presented this to the Community Planners Committee in September, and they recommended that three items be removed from this update. Those items are the personal storage requirements for multifamily residential, artisan food and beverage producer, and the transit priority implementation item number 34. That passed by a vote of 21 to 6 to 2. Next steps uh, include Land Use and Housing Committee in November with City Council sometime in December, and then the submittal to the Coastal Commission for effectiveness within the coastal areas um, sometime early next year. And I'm here to answer any questions. I've also got staff available um, to answer any questions you guys may have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let, let's just talk, are there clarification questions before we get into the uh, public testimony portion? And hold on just to, if you could go ahead and it's good to share this maybe for a few more seconds, but I can't see any hands raised until we uh, go back to a full screen. I, I think that's okay. All right, uh, any clarification questions, Commissioner Modane? Um, could you clarify the um, section 143.1103, uh, the mobility choices? I was a little confused on what the VMT impacts are if you provide more parking than what's in the development regulations. I don't know if you can go into a little more detail on that. I can answer that question, uh, Commissioner Heidi Bonblum, Deputy Director in the Planning Department. Um, one of the clarifications included in this code amendment is that um, projects that provide excess parking, um, which studies show um, can result in greater VMT, uh, we would be requiring um, the um, provision of additional VMT reduction measures to offset that additional parking. And what would be, what, can you give me an example of what one of those offset um, mitigation measures might be? Sure. Yeah, so currently um, the um, VMT um, measure requirement is by mobility zone. So downtown is mobility zone one. All of the city's TPAs are mobility zone two. Um, generally VMT efficient areas are mobility zone three and everything else is in mobility zone four. Already um, development projects within mobility zones two and three are required to provide um, those additional VMT um, reduction measures. 
There's a whole slew of them set forth in the land development manual, but examples would be like high visibility crosswalks, additional street trays, anything that um, sort of makes walking and biking more desirable in the neighborhood. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, any other clarification questions? Just raise your hand. Okay, seeing as none, um, let's go into the public testimony. Now, before we begin, um, I want to set kind of the rules here, but I would like everybody who would like to speak so we can get a count, click on the uh, raise hand icon on the lower portion of your screen um, if you'd like to speak on this item. Okay, it's still populating here. Okay, we have, okay, um, what we're going to do this, we're gonna allow three minutes per speaker. Um, and I do keep a tight schedule, so I will cut you off after three. So please keep your comments down below two, three minutes. And we will begin uh, with, actually, I'm trying to remember the person who first got up who wanted to, no, never mind. that was the other item. Let's start with Cheryl Briarton. Cheryl. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. I'm a 45 year old, a 45 year homeowner in Greater Golden Hill, South Park. And I've been on the planning committee here for over 10 years and participated in the 2016 community plan update. I have reviewed many code changes over the years and I have to give a shout out to Renee Mezzo, who is the kindest, most patient person in answering questions. But today there are three uh, proposals before you which I oppose. And I'd like to uh, explain a little bit although I did submit some written comments. First of all, I support the highest level process review for development on environmentally sensitive lands. And so I oppose the proposed amendment to section 1120604 it eliminates the process five review for capital improvement projects and public projects on environmentally sensitive lands and seeks to apply a process two level review based on an alleged, uh, allegedly controlling and inconsistent section that never was reviewed by planning committees back in 2019 because it was brought forward at the last minute without adequate time for review. If a section should be changed, it is the one that applies a process to review to environmentally sensitive lands where your commission has the final say on appeals. Now, as you know, I highly respect city staff like Renee Mezzo and all of you appointed volunteer commissioners, expertise and dedication. Today I heard you had 400 pages to review and I too review voluminous documents as a member of community planning groups. So, and then as I mentioned in my public comment uh, on non-agenda items, it, the city of San Diego doesn't even know the climate impact of infrastructure projects. And because there are significant impacts to municipal budgets in these days of rapid climate change, wildfires, flooding, pollution, rising seas, and all the rest of the hey, calamities, Cheryl. I'm sorry, Cheryl, that your time is up, but thank you for those comments. Uh, Maurice de Pasquale. 
Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Maris Di Pasquale, and I am here this morning speaking on behalf of Raising Cane's Restaurants. For those of you not familiar with us, we focus on doing one thing and doing it better and faster than anyone, quality chicken finger meals. We're a growing restaurant chain, still owned and led by our founder, and we are actively and charitably engaged in all the communities we do business in. We are proud of our record of developing sustainable restaurant operations in the region, which employ hundreds of San Diegans, all the while giving back to our community. We feel the proposal before you today with the moratorium on drive-throughs in transit priority areas has unintended consequences, including forcing new drive-throughs to be located outside of transit priority areas, which are more remote and away from urban centers, negating any improvement on vehicle miles traveled. Because this code update may not change anything for existing drive-throughs, many companies will be competing to purchase the ones that already exist thereby driving up land values and economically locking existing drive-throughs in place permanently. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to work with the city to find a compromise to ensure that restaurants like ours and our colleagues in the industry can continue to expand and flourish in the city of San Diego. Thank you for your time this morning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marshall Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, Marshall Anderson speaking on behalf of NAOP San Diego, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. We want to start by thanking staff for their work on this and for partnering with us on several improvements, including changes to the downtown employment overlay zone, which we support. While we're largely supportive of the update, our members are extremely concerned about the proposed ban on drive-throughs included in this current draft and as reflected in our coalition letter, which you should have all received. Our chief concern relates to process. A change of this magnitude warrants direct conversation with impacted parties, including those in the consumer community who depend on drive throughs for safety and convenience. We believe there are other means of addressing staff's concerns being used to justify this change and that a separate focused discussion should occur to look at options that might serve both staff's interests as well as those of the community. This is why we agree with the community planning planners committee recommendation to remove the drive-through ban from the 2021 code update. As noted, we provided specific reasons why we think a drive-through ban is not appropriate and will not achieve the goals staff describes in their report. We also believe the proposal is too broad given COVID-driven changes to restaurant operations and how food is delivered safely to customers. Now is not the time and the LDC is not the vessel for a change this drastic. Thank you for your consideration. We and our coalition partners are here to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Summer Bales. Good morning, Chair Hoffman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Summer Bales and I'm speaking on behalf of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, whose mission is to make the San Diego region the best place to live and work. While the Chamber otherwise supports the code update, we respectfully request the removal of item 34, the banning of drive throughs and TPAs. The city's annual code update is intended for minor amendments to simplify and improve codes for the applicant community. This prohibition of drive-throughs and TPAs is a major code change and should be pulled for further discussion with the impacted stakeholder community. As we're aware, the item was reviewed in the planning department's third code update workshop, yet there was no thorough stakeholder engagement. This proposed change not only affects future drive-throughs, but drive-ins. Both drive-throughs and curbside pickup options were lifelines to businesses struggling to remain open and safe during the pandemic, and although COVID-related government restrictions are temporary, preferences for safe and convenient access to food and services will continue long-term. We recognize that the code amendment was made to help the city reach its climate action goals, and we recognize the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the city. However, we would like to see further analysis of how a drive-through and drive-in ban on future eating and drinking establishments would contribute to a meaningful redu reduction in GHGs in San Diego, in addition to considering the economic impact on business. Other jurisdictions that have considered bans on drive throughs have conducted studies specific to their city before advancing such a policy, including Long Beach and Palm Springs. It's for these reasons the Chamber requests the removal of item 34 for additional stakeholder discussion and feedback. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Noah Harris. 
Uh, good morning, um, Planning Commissioners. This is Noah Harris, uh, Policy Advocate with Climate Action Campaign, calling in support of the proposal to stop future drive throughs and transit priority areas. Uh, as I said earlier, the city's 2015 Climate Action Plan set ambitious targets for the percentage of commuters taking bike, walk, and transit in transit priority areas, uh, known as mode shift targets. Transportation accounts for more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector in the region by far, and achieving the cap mode shift targets is a cornerstone of the city's overall climate goals. Um, in the last six years, we've made very little progress towards those targets, especially for biking and walking. Transitioning away from car-centric infrastructure, especially in TPAs, uh, is necessary if we are to achieve our mode shift targets. Prohibiting future drive-throughs and TPAs will make our streets safer, especially for the roads most vulnerable users, such as pedestrians and cyclists, while helping to make progress towards the city's mobility, safety, equity, and climate goals. We are in a climate emergency and we need to make policy changes like this. Um, we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marisa Tucker Borquez. Borquez. Hello all, my name is Marissa Tucker Borquez and I am uh, representing uh, the Yembe Democratic Club of San Diego County as its president. So um, this ordinance, um, and I'm speaking with regards to item one, sub item 34, which aims to ban drive-throughs and transit priority areas, which we are very much in support of. So this ordinance in no way is intended to punish, limit, or restrict fast food chains or franchises from operating within San Diego. Rather, this is really about regulating their form to fit into our rapidly urbanizing communities. Um, and this type of um, ordinance is not novel at all. San Luis Obispo has done this since 1982. Minneapolis just adopted something similar just this last year. So these cities still continue to support a variety of franchise restaurants and they operate successfully without drive-throughs. And we just simply believe that drive-throughs are fundamentally incompatible uses within transit priority areas. And honestly, one need not look for further, of course, than El Cajon Boulevard. Um, so recently, the North Park Planning uh, Community Plan was updated to promote mixed use, density, walkability. And I think in many cases, we've seen that it really has worked. There are new um, residential buildings with ground floor mixed uses that are really supporting our local business and driving our economic growth. Yet on that exact same corridor within a few blocks, we have drive throughs that are reminiscent of suburban stroll that really limits this progress. And we believe that infill land should really be used more productivity instead of being used to accommodate idling automobiles. Um, in addition, um, like access free parking and highway widening drive throughs induce automotive demand. And so if we're trying to reduce our VMT, this just doesn't make sense if we're trying to reach our climate action goals. Um, in addition, these drive-through designs have curb cut demands um, and that create conflict zones between cars, pedestrians, and cyclists and wheelchair users. They are dangerous and wholly incompatible with the city's vision zero goals. Fundamentally, curb cuts should be minimized within transit priority areas where we're trying to promote dense walkable neighborhoods that support these um, alternative mobility options. So banning these drive-throughs are just one small step toward this goal. And for those reasons, we are hoping that you will support um, item one, sub item 34. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marissa. John Allen. Thank you, Commissioners. This is John Allen. I'm representing Streamline Development Group, multifamily housing developer in San Diego, mostly in the urban infill space. Uh, overall, I have a very favorable opinion of the land development code update. Overall, the uh, all members of staff, including especially Renee, have done an amazing job organizing and fielding questions. Uh, despite all the hard work that's been put in, I think there are two items I'd like to uh, just put some food for thought for. Item three, uh, the landscape requirements for the complete community plan housing solutions. Uh, the concern here is the loss of developable area on sites that are more than 25K square feet. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to provide essentially a 20 foot wide pedestrian pathway because it basically amounts to a dedication of land, which can be rather significant. What is the intent of this section? I think obviously walkability is the important thing here. And it seems like the intent is to provide for additional landscaping that enhances the pedestrian experience. 
The updates attempt to provide flexibility where there is too much rigidity, or there may be spacing issues related to utilities and other site conditions, but it simply falls short. A couple potential solutions or changes to this specific item uh, could, that could help address this. For sites that have a 10 foot wide sidewalk that is mandated or allowed for this section, maybe the required street trees can be located within the 10 foot sidewalk on either edge of the sidewalk, provided that the trees are provided with tree grates, allowing for ADA accessibility. That would provide a little bit more flexibility. Identify sidewalk widening requirements could also be done uh, based on the type of street, whereas primary arterials and major, herb, major streets can require this widening, whereas maybe collector streets and local streets where it wouldn't make as much sense don't need to. The other item I wanted to bring up was item 10, the mobility choices requirement. I believe it was Commissioner Moden who had uh, questions about this as well. This is still unclear, and there's a concern that it's ambiguous on the specific minimums pointed to in the section. Assuming that the, the PSTPA minimums of zero are not the minimums, but when it mentions the, for the purpose of this section, et cetera, um, it should probably indicate the specific table 142-05C and which column it refers to in that table as the minimums. Is it the basic? Is it the transit area minimums? Um, so that's all I have for this. Uh, thanks so much for your work, staff. Okay, thank you. Naval Magnesi. And perhaps I pronounced that wrong. Navo uh, Magnesi. Uh, you are on mute, just so you know. Uh, sorry, I did not. I, I accidentally raised my hand. I have no comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, John Zebarth. John, you just muted yourself. Okay, um, I have also people that have ceded me time. Okay, can you, uh, I'll stop there. Tell me those people who are ceding their time. Uh, they sent in a written comment last night and they're on the phones now. Luis Delgado. Uh, wait, wait, and go slowly, please. Oh, excuse me. Luis Delgado. Okay. Tom Adam. Aaron Rodriguez. And Mike McCarley. And I'm going to try and keep it very brief, but. No, I understand. And uh, Sabrina, can you verify that those names are there, those people are present? I'm doing that right now. Okay, thank you. What one was Mike? What was Mike's last name? Mike McCarley, M C C A R L E Y. Unless they're on with a phone number, I don't see that name. Oh. If I have even one more person that would see time, I can, I can do it. You've got uh, 12 minutes right now with the people. I'm going to try and do it in four. Okay. Um, why don't we go with that? And uh, if you. Well, if you have one more, just put it on there just for safety. Right. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, I want to discuss item 34, the prohibitions of drive-throughs and TPA. Staff says this is necessary due to inconsistency with the CAPS mode share goals and in order to promote pedestrian bicycle circulation. I beg to disagree. Even with the aggressive goals of the CAP, vehicles represent 50% of the mode share for commuter traffic and will even more for non-commuter traffic in 2035. And I want you to note that the TPA map that's being used is theoretical transit in 2035 and not the existing TPA map for 2025 or today. So let's examine the transit benefit. The community plan updates and even the Marina specific plan, which is tailored around the new trolley line, assume that traffic reduced, uh, transit reduced traffic by potentially only 15% which leaves about 85% is still vehicular traffic. They found that there were significant traffic impacts even on freeways with the transit that's being proposed. But let's be clear, traffic congestion doesn't promote safe pedestrian and bicycle circulation. 
The parking standards in the San Diego Municipal Code only gives a 14% reduction in parking requirements in transit priority areas. And that includes the pedestrian oriented mixed use zones, 14% reduction. In the 2000 Land Development Code, drive throughs were located along major roadways because that was where the vehicles were. Those road roadways sometimes have 30, 40, or even 50,000 cars per day. They're not gonna disappear, even with the reduction with transit. The goal, most of the sites um, along the major arterials were zoned CC1 auto-oriented to try and, and locate these things to minimize impacts on our neighborhoods. Then we look at what is a community commercial? According to the International Council of Shopping Centers, the service areas for community commercial, which are located along our transit priority corridors where the vehicles are, is approximately five mile radius, which is greater than a reasonable walking distance. Can you imagine the majority of customers going to Home Depot, Target, or even a movie theater using transit, bicycles, or walking? Well, let me talk about the public demand. Retail industry is a business that responds to public demand, unlike necessarily the government. If you have ever sat in the queue of a drive through you understand the public demand for drive throughs Double drive through lanes and or employees outside taking orders have been implemented to handle the public demand. Almost no new Starbucks are built without a drive through Starbucks and Dutch Brothers have developed in response to public demand, a small 900 square foot model that has a drive through and no indoor seating. Traditional non drive through businesses such as Jamba Juice, Habit, Panera, Panda Express have all developed drive through models in response to public demand. And this doesn't even take into consideration the impact of COVID on indoor seating. Let's look at the council action this week. Finally, let's talk about public in, uh, involvement in the code update process. Property owners, tenants, and their respective organizations, as well as the public, were not adequately informed or involved in these virtual discussions. Many impacted par uh, parties did not even find out about this prohibition until the end of September, a month ago. Why weren't they part of the development of this ordinance? What is the economic impact of this prohibition? Why didn't the planning department talk to the stakeholders that will be impacted? I respectfully request a recommendation uh, that, as recommended by the CPC that the code update item 34, prohibiting drive-throughs in transit priorities areas be removed from the current code update so that the impacted stakeholders may participate in a dialogue with the planning department and the city on this regulation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Josh Coyne, or Cohn. Good, good morning, Planning Commissioners. My name is Josh Coyne, Director of Government Affairs with the Downtown San Diego Partnership. With our more than 300 members, we serve as the principal voice and driving force behind a downtown that benefits the entire region. Our mission is to promote the economic prosperity and cultural vitality of downtown San Diego. San Diego currently faces a housing crisis and we need all types of housing. And it's critical that we are thinking outside of the box when it comes to solutions. We support the recommended amendments to the employment overlay zone to allow increased flexibility for additional housing while encouraging employment uses throughout all of downtown. We are still recovering from the economic impacts of the pandemic and many of the updates to the land development code before you today will help build a stronger, more prosperous urban core. Thank you to director Mike Hansen and his team Heidi, Renee, and Brian for their work on these updates and for the input they considered in drafting this year's updates. Thank you commissioners for your time and service. Okay, thank you. Kathleen Neal. Thank you. Um, this is Kathleen Neal uh, representing the La Jolla Community Planning Association. I wanted to thank Renee Mezzo very much for all of the work that she's done. I found her very responsive and I certainly appreciate it and so does the group. I did want to say that the La Jolla CPA does, uh, has supported the work to improve the signage. Uh, we, we support the drawing that was submitted for height determination and we support the um, changes to the La Jolla Shores PDO. Um, as a part of the community planning committee, um, I noticed at, at the meeting where we reviewed this that our member from the border area was concerned 
about the impact of artisan food in all industrial zones. And I wondered if possibly Mr. Schoenfisch or Ms. Von Blum could address that concern. The person from the border area planning group was concerned that her area would be overly impacted by any changes that occurred because they have so much light industrial around their residential. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to Renee. Okay, Kathleen, thank you. Nicole Burgess. Uh, good morning, Chuck uh, uh, Hoffman and planning commissioners. I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and I ask you, uh, thank staff, city staff, for their efforts with these code updates. It's super important. And I wanna speak in favor of item 34. Um, again, my name is Nicole Burgess. I sit on the city of San Diego mobility board and represent district five. I am also a, a commercial property owner and I understand the opposition. First, I wanna give kudos to, please echo all the comments made by Marissa Tucker because those were spot on. Um, these are, and Noah Harris, the, the, this is about a climate emergency. And so we have to, we have to just get rid of these cars. And so working around our transit priority areas um, to reduce the conflicts for bikers and walkers is extremely important. In fact, I chair a Vision Zero subcommittee and this was actually a recommendation. So I, I was super excited to see Heidi and the team um, actually have this code update already going forward. So, and just, just speaking for the opposition, I mean, I'm a, as a landowner, the space is so valuable. Like the last thing we need to do is be having cars idling and taking up space. And sometimes it overflows to the streets and bikeways that I'm trying to navigate safely on. So, uh, you know, the space, you, could, you don't even have to rent as much space. You, your customers will still come to you if they like your food. So we have to think of the dangers of what the car society has done to us. And, and every moment somebody comes out of a driveway, there is a risk for that person walking and biking. And in transit priority areas, that is only one third of the city. We have to change the model for these businesses and move forward with this kind of action. So I ask this planning board commissioners to support item 34 and really like, yeah, help our city achieve our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chris Dugan. Good morning, Chairman Hoffman, Chair Hoffman and Planning Commissioners, Chris Duggan, Director of Government Affairs with the California Restaurant Association. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on agenda item one, testify this morning to register CRA strong opposition and to respectfully request the removal of amendment number 32, formerly item 34, the ban on drive-throughs in the San Diego's draft 2021 code update matrix. CRA bases our position and recommendation for removal of item 32 on three primary factors. The first and one that we feel is mission critical to any public policy process is the clear absence of stakeholder outreach by the city to the CRA and the restaurants who utilize drive-throughs for their customers. And while it has been stated that this is also considered a minor insignificant policy change, CRA firmly believes that a ban on drive-throughs is actually a major land use policy decision. One that we feel will have a direct and negative impact to the future growth of a sector of the restaurant community that served and continues to safely serve the dining public during COVID-19. In addition to the absence of direct community outreach to the CRA, we believe that any land development code policy modification of this magnitude deserves at the very least full analysis of the data and presentation of and full, a full economic impact study. Furthermore, the premise of this proposal seems to be based on an incorrect assumption that the city does not currently possess planning tools to work closely with our restaurant members with drive-throughs in addressing any community safety or environmental concerns. These planning options must not be dismissed, but be discussed, evaluated, and utilized prior to any outright, outright ban on drive-throughs. Therefore, again, the CRA respectfully requests that the Planning Commission remove amendment item 32, formerly 34, from the San Diego 2021 code update. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Brittany Ruggles-Wallace. 
Thank you. Good morning, Com Chairperson Hoffman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Brittany Ruggles Wallace, KLR Planning, a local woman owned planning and environmental consulting business. Our staff has worked side by side with city staff in reviewing, understanding, and testing the various proposed changes to the LDC that will affect the development community. We are very happy to see that many of the changes we have suggested to city staff are part of the code update, and we thank staff for their earnest considerations of our recommended refinements. There are a few items which we were not successful with staff relative to revisions that are needed and offer the following recommendations for your consideration. Relative to section 143.0110 where ESL applies, currently all lot line adjustments can be processed ministerially. This revision requires a lot line adjustment that removes ESL from a site to be processed via a discretionary process to NDP. We object to adding this level of review and approval to an otherwise benign mapping process. The current regulations allow for a win-win by conserving ESL while facilitating development that occurs on a portion of the lot not affected by ESL. Requiring a lot line adjustment to be discretionary in this regard would result in otherwise ministerial projects undertaking costly and timely discretionary permitting. Relative to section 143.1025A2, supplemental development regulations for complete communities housing solutions, the proposed change results in a requirement for a double row of 24 inch box trees along the frontages which would result in an approximately 15% reduction in development intensity and development density on corner lots where th this is required on two frontages. Rather than requiring the trees located on either side of the sidewalk, the trees should be allowed within the 10 foot sidewalk widening, which would accomplish the goal of enhancing the pedestrian experience without drastically reducing the developable area. Finally, section 131.0718, the supplemental regulations for premises greater than five acres in the mixed use zones the proposed change to this code section would add a statement that lot line adjustments cannot be used to reduce the size of premises to eliminate the applicability of these requirements. This change is inappropriate and may preclude projects that could otherwise successfully implement mixed use zones. Additionally, it is unclear how staff will determine if a proposed lot line adjustment is in fact to reduce the size of a lot to avoid these regulations and not for other reasons such as financial or economic purposes. Lot line adjustments can be a successful means for redevelopment to occur on undeveloped or underutilized portions of sites where existing improvements or uses can be retained. This language prohibits the creation of new lots in the mixed use zones less than five acres, which greatly reduces infill redevelopment potential, as well as smaller scale redevelopment that more organically blends with the existing community. The existing requirements for premises greater than five acres in size can be quite onerous and can drastically affect the amount of land remaining for actual development. This regulation could result in sites becoming unable to carry enough development intensity to create a financially and economically viable project. And we recommend the new language not be included in the update. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tershia de Elgin. Sorry if I mispronounce that. No, it's a hard name. Hi, my name is Tershia de Elgin and I'm an off and on uh, activist and project leader for Kenyan revitalization projects. And I'm, Thank you, first of all, commissioners, for this hard job that you're doing. Thank you, and thank you, Renee Mezzo. Um, I am also um, here, as Cheryl Briarton was, is, was <laughs> um, opposing the amendment to section 112.0604 for um, reasons I've already written to you at length about. However, here are a couple more. Um, the CEQA compliance component seems to me to be uh, greatly inadequate. It refers, it says um, in the document, implementation of this project's actions would not result in new significant direct, indirect, or cumulative impacts over and above those disclosed in the previously certified environmental impact report of 2008. Well, this um, sounds spurious because the proposed review process for environmentally sensitive lands is reduced by this amendment or would it be from a process five to a process two uh, for reasons of inconsistency. Well, why not the other way around to have the consistency be always a process five for ESL? And then uh, also, as other people have noted, um, the review process for these um, revisions seems not to have been very, here's, here's what happened with the community planners committee that met on October 22nd, 2019. Quote, due to the fast tracking of this item without sufficient time to be evaluated by the community planning committee, 
this item is recommended for postponement until the January meeting. Um, and Planning Commission and City Council should not consider this item until after CPC's January vote. Well, it, and that was a um, unanimous vote by the, on the part of that committee. Um, I see also, and yet it went ahead to the January um, meeting with City Council anyway. Um, I see also that the project or that the revisions were reviewed by the code monitoring team and the technical advisory committee. And um, from having worked in the canyons for 21 years and worked with a lot of consultants, I can say that the level of expertise as it relates to coastal canyons that are intermittently hammered by extreme stormwater runoff um, is, it, it confounds even the best of hydrologists and engineers and habitat restoration professionals. And this is another additional reason why I oppose the amendment uh, section 112604. Thanks a lot for listening to me. Okay, Tricia, um, thank you. Uh, Ann Fage. Yes, I'm Ann Fage. I chair the Community Forest Advisory Board. Housing is undeniably important, but so are trees, shade, and health. With this and other code provisions, infill results in narrow property setbacks, removal of large older trees, and increased heat retaining pavement. In this code revision, there's some great provisions, notably community gardens, public promenade nods, and on-site parks. Thank you. The pedestrian circulation uh, space for street trees is essential. However, for some communities, the 15 gallon size is a better approach for long-term tree health, even though 24 inch box is um, most appropriate for heavy use areas. So I'd la add that flexibility. These infill impacts can be mitigated so they don't undermine the city's obligations to climate action and adaptation. First, greater commitment is needed for planting trees that thrive, such as adequate soil space, community-based tree watering, or, um, or um, irrigation systems, concrete removal, credit on water bills uh, for individual residents. This can only be accomplished with increased professional staff as the city forester staff is underfunded and overcommitted. Second, code enforcement is needed to ensure that trees grow healthy for decades. Many commercial property owners are not maintaining trees in parking lots and landscaping that were required in their permits. The city needs to hire code enforcement officers that are arborists and that can issue compliance notices, collect fines that offset salaries and require trees to actually be replaced and maintained according to national standards. A third option is to admit that the city promises climate action, but permits vast reductions in trees. We can have both healthy quality neighborhoods and additional housing. And I and a number of others are very anxious to work with, with uh, city departments to accomplish this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jesse O'Sullivan. Good morning, my name is Jesse O'Sullivan and I'm policy counsel at Circulate San Diego. I'm calling today to support the land development code update that prohibits new drive-throughs within transit priority areas. Drive-throughs are a safety hazard for pedestrians and bicycle riders. Drive-throughs have more driveways than traditional restaurants and therefore create more conflict between pedestrians and bike riders and drivers. Cars often line up for drive-throughs out on the neighborhood streets, which blocks bike lanes and sidewalks and forces walkers and riders out into traffic. In addition, drivers are often distracted as they come in and out of drive-throughs. In addition to being a safety hazard, drive-throughs are an environmental hazard. Cars, cars idle for long periods of time in a drive-through. This worsens air quality, which causes health problems for nearby residents and workers. It also releases greenhouse gases. The city needs, as we heard from Noah from Climate Action Campaign earlier, the city needs to do more to meet its climate action plan targets and in particular its mode shift targets. drive throughs also require building large stretches of asphalt which are hostile to pedestrians and an inefficient use of space. Especially in transit priority areas, San Diego needs to be prioritizing the safety of pedestrians and bicycle riders. drive throughs conflict with that need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Andy Hanshaw.
Andy, you've, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Andy Hanshaw uh, with the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition. I am also chair of the city's uh, mobility board. I also want to express my strong support um, for the code update for item 34, prohibit or banning new uh, drive-throughs in transit priority areas. Um, the city is taking bold steps and uh, to reach their climate action plan goals um, and to encourage uh, more biking, walking and transit use. Uh, and we must do more to, uh, particularly in the transit priority areas to uh, reach these goals. Additionally, as we've heard, um, from a bicyclist standpoint, it is a safety concern. Um, we already know this from existing drive-throughs and obstructions happening on uh, bike lanes, on street bike lanes that currently exist. And I think this is a, a, a very necessary and a bold step to uh, make our streets safer for cyclists. Um, we need to think big, think bold, and we need to uh, reduce uh, car exhaust and the idling of cars that actually, you know, happens at, at drive-throughs. I know this is for new drive-throughs in TPAs. I would hope that we could take this even further uh, and sort of look at those, um, those problem areas of drive-throughs that currently exist that are causing obstructions, backing up traffic, congestion, and adding to our pollution, and additionally causing safety hazards for bikeless, for cyclists. So I encourage you to uh, support this code amendment that city staff has brought forward and we will be hearing this at the mobility board next week um, and uh, taking action on it as well. But for the bike coalition, uh, we strongly support this, uh, this code update. Thank you. Cameron Hoffman, you're muted. My wife just came in to bring me some hot chocolate, so I muted it. Sorry about that. Uh, that, that was our last speaker. Um, so with that, I would like to close the public testimony portion. Uh, we can get into planning commission discussion, um, but before we do, I just, by show of hands, if, does anybody commissioners uh, need a break? Okay, I see no one, so we'll go ahead and get into planning commission discussion. And I'm gonna start from the top, Commissioner Austin, if you can begin on this item. All right, thank you. Well, there's a lot in this document and what's being proposed, and clearly the one that seems to be striking the most debate is the one about the drive-throughs. And this is one where I see the benefits and the questions uh, that are raised by what's proposed. And maybe my biggest question is, is it proper to bring it up in a, in a group of, of um, ordinance changes such as this? So rather than opine on that so much, I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna listen to what the other commissioners, how they feel about, about that issue, because that's one issue that has some some merit. I tend to lean towards uh, endorsing the elimination of the drive-throughs. I am one philosophically who's quite opposed to what's happened to America uh, and how we gave away basically um, our cities to the car. We're gradually taking it back and it can't happen fast enough as far as I'm concerned. I think I mentioned this last time uh, that um, there are a number of cities such as Copenhagen and Melbourne, which have uh, really set an example for uh, doing that and creating much, much better environments for all. Uh, I understand the economic impacts, but this is not taking away uh, from those that have already been established. This is you know, something that happens in the future. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Generally speaking, I think the majority of these updates are good, they're needed. The other one that was spoken about was adding more flexibility downtown with the employment overlay. And while we don't currently have any projects we're looking at in those areas, we have studied that in the past and it's been a real uh, problem for 
uh, for development and, and for housing. Um, I think that creating that flexibility is a good thing. Um, the rest of these items, um, I think are just items that are, that are good cleanup items uh, and that are going in the right direction. I'm gonna be short today and, and, and listen because I wanna see where the other commissioners are coming down on the, the ones that are most controversial. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you. Um, I will also try to be brief, although I may not make it to be as brief as Commissioner Austin. Uh, I do want to echo a lot of the public statements. Uh, Ms. Mezzo, great work as always. Uh, I think putting you in charge of the code update process was perhaps one of the most genius moves the planning department has made in recent history. Uh, there are some things I really, really like about this update. Uh, the diff fee changes are great. Uh, I appreciate that we're removing the storage requirements for multifamily housing because that frequently shows up um, as something where developers are asking or using an incentive to get exceptions anyway. So I, I think it just makes sense with, with how the how things are actually happening in the real world. Giving credit where credit is due, I would like to thank the La Jolla Community Planning Association on the La Jolla Shores PDO clarifications. Um, I know you guys have been frustrated with me in the past when I have pushed back on appeals, especially uh, where you are challenging the density of a project that's been approved. And I've made the comment before that you should get the, the zoning and the ordinance changed to include that. And you guys have now done that. So thank you for listening. And I fully support that change. Uh, I have three really, really minor, I believe, editorial comments. Um, Ms. Mezzo, uh, on page 19 of 87 in the ordinance strike out document, uh, the, it appears under the RMX and EMX zone that footnote number three is struck out. And I believe that that should actually stay. I'm giving you a chance to take notes so you can check on these. You said the footnote three? It's footnote three. It's actually lined through in the strikeout, and I believe that was unintentional. All right, we'll take a look. Thanks. On page 23 of 87 in the ordinance strikeout, uh, this is interim ground floor residential. Uh, at the top of that page, residential is struck through, and I believe that word should actually stay in. What page was that? Uh, it was page 23 of 87. That's not the PDF page, Chair. That's, that's No, I, I, I understood. I didn't hear the 23. Yep. Got it. And then uh, on page 24 of 87 in section 131 uh, there's a typo in here. The sentence actually reads as accessible, main accessible. Um, I think it was just supposed to be main accessible path of travel. Yeah, that one actually has been caught. So okay. we got one. Thank you. I'm just trying to prove I actually did the read. <laughs> I'm that annoying student. Okay, so that leads me to one that I don't know is as controversial as the drive-throughs, which I promise I'm going to come back to. Um, and this is on the, the composting uh, organic waste language, uh, specifically in page, on page 36 and 37 uh, within the strikeout ordinance. Um, in section 142.0810 subpart D, uh, it's asking for signage identifying uh, the material storage area, which is required uh, to be posted on the exterior. And I guess my question is th the way this is written and the way the table is set up, it appears that this applies to single family residential or single dwelling units, um, which would seem to mean that if someone is doing an accessory dwelling unit permit or, um, or a single family residential permit that they now have to actually put up signage next to their trash recycling and organic waste cans. I don't know that that makes sense in a single family setting. 
Um, so I just wanted to clarify if that was in fact the intent. And then further in section 1420820, um, there's a requirement that we have to indicate interior and exterior refuse, organic waste and recycling uh, material storage areas, um, both shown for the interior and the exterior areas. Again, that appears to apply to accessory dwelling units and single uh, family residential units. And I'm not 100% sure that's the intent, um, but I do know that there will be plan checkers downtown that will kill you if you don't do it, um, if you're trying to run it through. So I just I just want to get some clarity if, if that was in fact intended to apply to all residential construction or if the state's mandating that it applies to all residential construction or if we're not just being overly broad with how we did the language. We can take a look at that for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, and, and that's, those aren't going to prevent me from supporting that section. I just, I just want to make sure that we're not building in something that's going to require a code update cleanup next cycle. Um, okay. So that takes me to the drive-through issue. I'm, I'm seriously conflicted on this item. I appreciate the intent, but it feels like the public outreach part of this maybe was missed. And I, and I really, this is like the seventh code update I've been involved with at various levels. And it, this seems like the kind of thing that the code update was intended to avoid because this seems like it's major land use planning and policy shifting via footnote. And I just don't think that the code update process is the right way of doing this. Um, I, and, and I think it's because there's gonna be some unintended consequences. I, I mean, Ms. Tucker Borquez actually made one of the points that I wanna make. She was talking about El Cajon Boulevard. I was actually looking at this in the sports arena area. Um, I, I drove around the area by my office yesterday because I am this level of nerd and I counted the number of restaurants that have drive-throughs that will be affected by this. And there are 11 on sports arena and Midway in between Rosecrans and uh, West Point Loma Boulevard. And this is an area that we desperately want to redevelop. And essentially, if we pass this moratorium as it's written, I think what's gonna happen is we're going to enshrine those restaurants and their drive-throughs in gold. And that those areas are never going to redevelop because you've just made it the highest and best use for that property. Um, I also noticed that in that same area, there was a bank with a drive through ATM and a Walgreens with a pharmacy drive through And I don't, I don't know how we apply this to restaurant drive throughs without applying it to other businesses. Um, from a policy standpoint, if this is in fact aimed at, uh, at, at the, the climate action plan and, and mobility and complete streets, which I am a huge supporter of, I would actually think that we'd go after gas stations and TPAs before we would go after restaurant drive-throughs. Um, from a policy standpoint, that seems to be a more consistent approach to this. So I, I am prepared to support all of this code update with the exception of the drive-through moratorium, whether that's item 32 or 34, I can't remember now. Um, so I'm actually just, just so that this is on the floor and proceeding forward, I, I'm going to actually make a motion, Chair Hoffman, to support staff's recommendations for this item with the exception of the, the drive-through moratorium, which I ask to be struck from the document that we advance. Okay, we have a motion to support staff recommendation and dropping uh, 134 for drive-through prohibition. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor a, from Commissioner Boomhauer and a second by Commissioner Malbro. Um, so we'll continue on with discussion. Did that conclude uh, your uh, portion, Commissioner Boomhauer? That did, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Malbro. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, uh, 
Smizo, uh, thank you for your hard work and of course the staff, because I've been involved in this from a community planning level and I know how difficult this is. Uh, and you've done pretty well, uh, pretty much a great job on that. So thank you again for that. Um, I should have asked this first question during clarification and it's item 30, which has to do with personal storage for multi-use residential. So you say you want to create more flexibility and reform of that. And in looking through the documents, it basically says that the 240 cubic feet required now does not apply. So does that mean that there is no minimum at all for this? And please explain how that would work. Yeah, that's correct. So there would be no minimum. Um, that doesn't mean that a developer could not provide personal storage space, uh, but it would no longer be required um, as part of the development. Well, that kind of concerns me. I understand now. Thank you. Um, people that live in multifamily units sh should have some storage space. Uh, so I'm a little concerned about that. I understand how difficult that is for large developments to figure out how do you put 240 cubic feet on each unit? I, I fully understand that, but I, I fear that there will be units, in, in the, especially in the TPA areas where they won't provide any storage whatsoever. And what will people do with that? How will they store um, their items? I mean, they do have that right to have extra items. So I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I'll move on. Uh, item 34, look, you know, I would like to say this works for everyone, but it doesn't. Uh, and I feel like I have to speak for those who may not have a voice. There are communities uh, in this city who don't want to be auto dependent, but they don't have a choice in being auto dependent. And this pretty much takes them, this, this can have an impact to them. And not only that, some of their communities, they already are having trouble getting retail in into their areas right now. And so I feel like I'm concerned with this, uh, with the transit priority area uh, implementation, it could hurt some communities that are underserved uh, because some of those businesses are willing to come in with drive-through. We have pharmacies, uh, we do have a few um, food, food businesses that are looking at it, but they have not committed. And I'm concerned that they will not. So how do we address that? Uh, it, it just, you know, we have to look at these things. It, it's a great idea. I understand it. Uh, District 4 has three TPAs in it, and they're definitely affected. And, and they're going to have trouble getting establishments in there because of this. So how do we, how do we fix this? I, would, I don't want to get rid of it, but I just want us to take a look at those things. Sometimes a broad brush doesn't fix everything. And, and we really need to look at that and think about that. Again, these people do believe, I believe in a climate action plan. Many people in my community do, but they, they, there's some things that they just can't do and jobs, multiple families in, in one unit, uh, they are dependent on vehicles. And so it, it hurts them and we have to think about that. Uh, again, it's overall a good, good idea, but we need to always remember that it doesn't work for everyone. So that's why I'm not supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Modane. Yes, I'd like to thank staff. I know this is kind of um, a heavy lift to do all these updates um, through the code and, and cleaning it up. Um, so I appreciate the thoroughness of, the, of this report and um, of the code update. Um, I like a lot of the changes in this, uh, particularly the uh, elimination of disk deferral. Um, having diff fees due at time of completion is logically more appropriate since you're not actually making that impact until your project is done and um, saving um, or, or not being not having to have that cash um, outlay up front and, and saving on uh, construction loan interest for those two years or three years or however long your project takes to build. Um, it, it definitely helps projects financials uh, just incrementally, but um, this is a good measure. Um, I slightly disagree with um, my fellow commissioner on the 
uh, private storage. I, I'm happy to see that this is removed as a requirement. I think this should be a market uh, decision and not a city code item. So I'm happy to see that go. Um, and I also like the food and beverage language for the industrial uses. So I, I know there were some speakers that were not in favor of that, but I, I see a benefit to that. Uh, I still need a little more clarification, um, Ms. Van Bloom, on the mobility choice um, issue. It's not really sitting well with me and, and maybe I can get a little more clarification. When I go to the table that it refers to, it, it says that there is no parking requirement. So essentially the way that I'm interpreting this is if you do provide parking, on a project utilizing um, the complete communities housing solution in mobility three or one zones, you will inevitably have to provide the VMT mitigation offset points. Is that correct? No, so that is not the intent. The intent is that if excess parking, um, not applying the zero minimum parking in TPAs, um, but rather applying the otherwise applicable parking, we can definitely take a look at the language. Um, we've heard feedback on that throughout and we've tried to make it very clear that the intent is not to apply to the zero minimum, but to the otherwise applicable um, parking for multifamily residential as if it were outside of a TPA. Um, but we're happy to take a look and, and tighten up that language um, more as we move forward as well. Yeah, I would just tighten it up because it's murky to me. Now I don't go into these tables too often, but um, it would it would give me trepidation thinking that I, if I even provided some visitor parking or even that drop off zone that's now required as part of the no park you know no parking ordinance in the TPA there's that requirement to have a drop off space that to me feels like it triggers something so maybe if that could just be cleaned up um, it would help sure absolutely thank you um, the other issue. I'm concerned about is the street tree requirement um, in in um, section 143.10, uh, I think it's 25. So it does acknowledge that there are clearances for bus stops, um, but the increase in um, amount of trees in urban lots is, is extremely difficult to achieve um, and making that even more stringent. And I'm I'm very supportive of street trees. However, when you can't fit them all in there, it becomes really difficult. So I think um, there needs to be acknowledgement of infrastructure. For example, spg and &E vaults, um, you can't put street trees there. Um, other infrastructure um, running you know, through those sites, these are very tight lots and there is a ton of stuff that is through the right of way out to the street that precludes trees from being planted in those locations. Um, also accessibility requirements and also the, the drop off um, and pick up space that is now being required, which I'm very supportive of. I think it's important when we have ride share and all these, these other um, mechanisms um, to get around. I do think that's important so people aren't turning on flashers and in the middle of the street. Um, However, that's also going to eat into your ability to put in those street trees on very tight, small urban lots. And I feel that this program is geared towards these urban lots where we can do infill development. So I'd really like there to be a little more language on flexibility for existing conditions or future conditions to meet all the other requirements um, with the street trees. And I don't know if that's something that we can look at or explore, but um, the language right now is pretty strict on that. And I would, I'm afraid that an incentive would have to be used um, for this. We're happy to take a look at the language. Okay. Um, and then lastly, the drive throughs um, This is a polarizing issue and um, we've, we've heard for and against I'm kind of in the middle. I see the, the benefits of, of removing that. I also see um, the impact to the economy and local businesses. And so I think that this um, does need a little bit more public outreach. And I agree with um, removing it from um, the approval um, today. So um, otherwise I'm supportive of, of this. Good job. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Otsuji. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the formalizing consistent application of the Greenway Street requirements. Uh, I was greatly appreciative of seeing that 
in regards to formalizing that because it has uh, great guidelines and a lot of great input in regards to uh, the Greenway Street requirements. Uh, one of the things uh, I would like to see as we go along is to make sure uh, during the review process that each party understands the basic requirements of this because uh, uh, both the 14th Street Master Plan and the East Street Greenway Master Plan has a lot of information on there. And if you don't completely understand that side of the design process, it gets very confusing. So I'm hoping that when this is formalized that you know everybody has a formal intro in regards to how you interpret all these things. Secondly, um, and, and on the street trees, um, my comment on that, I, I like it being in there because we're always fighting for street trees and trees as a whole in our urban uh, design process that we have throughout the city. And I think it's important that it be there. Yes, it's not perfect, but that is the, the simplest thing that you can do to address climate action uh, in what we are today. Thirdly, uh, on the uh, organic waste, I'm glad, I was glad to see that. It, you know, it's a coming issue and it kind of dovetails into the other controversial issue of uh, free trash pickup for single home dwellings in the city of San Diego. But I was happy to see there, that in there because it kind of basically explains to you, you know, what that program is going to be about. And I think it's going to continue to add on to it in regards to uh, how we process that side of it. Uh, fourth, uh, on the community garden, I was glad to see that on there and uh, be a part of the park and rec department because I think it does need uh, good direction and oversight in regards to how it would fit into the community as a whole. And lastly, uh, on the drive-throughs. Um, my, my, my point of view right now is that I think it, it needs uh, some, some more time and restudy uh, uh, as some of the other commissioners have uh, stated. And I feel it's a bigger issue in regards to not just uh, keeping it in a simplistic form. And I think it needs more input from uh, everyone, especially the public and um, basically the, the users themselves and the develop, you know, the development side of these. And I think it's important to understand that, especially the, what we've gone through with COVID of how uh, beneficial this has been in regards to that. So I, I know that's only one issue of it, but if you go into the design process, I think we would get a bit of more understanding uh, of the drive-through itself and its purpose. And it does have negatives too, but uh, in the design process, many of the things could be addressed. And I think we can come up with a better uh, decision or guideline for that. And I will leave it at that point at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my turn. The, uh, well, first of all, staff, my co compliments to you as always for a great job on these yearly updates. Uh, you've covered a lot of stuff and I think there's a lot of great changes in there. And, and I can support uh, just about everything, but I do wanna talk about drive-throughs. Um, that seems to really be the main topic of discussion. And I'm just gonna give my thoughts on it. And that's all they are, just my thoughts, my opinions may not be popular uh, with everybody, but, but so be it. You know, we, we're, we're trying to get people to get out of their cars and, and that is a great goal. But in my way of thinking, we're trying to get people out of their gasoline powered cars. We're trying to get people uh, from idling, from polluting, and I think this is happening. It's very slow, but we are in a transitional time. And what's happening in my view is that cars are never going to go away. What I hope will happen is that they will slowly but surely become zero emission vehicles. 
And that is what's happening. Those are the trends. Uh, government requirements to go to electric vehicles, both public and private have been instituted. Uh, th this, this is happening, the, the money being put into it. You see Tesla giving away, or not giving away, but uh, making their deal with Hertz to have all electric fleet. Um, so I, I think that is happening and it's gonna happen hopefully sooner than we may think. Uh, another example, Waymo cars, they're, they're already operating self, driving cars are already operating in, for public use in Phoenix and San Francisco is soon going to follow. Uh, I just think there's always gonna be with our culture, uh, where there's always going to be cars on the road and, and with our infrastructure. So as we reduce our parking requirements throughout the city in both residential and commercial zones and especially in transit oriented zones, it, it makes sense to me that drive-throughs are, are an asset both to consumers and businesses. There's not going to be sufficient parking as we reduce that over time. Uh, and as long as we get these vehicles to be zero emission, we're not gonna have the climate uh, concerns uh, that we have now. And, and, and those concerns are really legitimate. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Otsuchi that uh, the, the conflict with bicycles, with pedestrians, that's a design issue. And I think that can be designed to be minimized. So, so it is, you know, I, I'm a cyclist. Uh, I, I, the, I think that's a huge issue, but I think design can do it. But I do support uh, removing that prohibition, um, the driver or the uh, drive-through prohibition. So I, I I support the motion on the floor. So anyway, those are my thoughts. But again, staff, very great job. That's my only difference. Um, and with that, uh, I'll see if anyone else has any other comments, just raise your hand. Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Yeah, I'm not sure it was 100% clear in my initial comments, but um, I, I really want to echo what some of the other commissioners said that went after me. I think that this issue is critically important and warrants further study. So I'm my motion to pull it from the ordinance doesn't mean that I, I don't wanna have further conversations about it and don't think it warrants further study. Uh, Commissioner Austin. Yeah, thank you. I thought actually the discussion was excellent regarding the drive-throughs and I'm gonna support the motion. I still, I think you're making some very good points, uh, Chairman Hoffman regarding the nature of, of cars in the future. However, there's some other points that I've seen, especially when I was on the orchids and onions um, jury, where we ended up giving an, an onion, not so much because it was a drive through and cars were idling, but what it did to that piece of property um, and, and how it impacted the street, the pedestrian experience, et cetera. So I think actually, having this discussion as a separate discussion, we can get into it in more depth. And maybe there's some modifications that create more of a win-win. The other thing I meant to say, and I failed to look at my own notes, uh, was uh, on the storage, I do believe that uh, adding the flexibility to storage will be a benefit. Um, we do a lot of work, uh, not only in San Diego, but all over, and especially up in Vancouver, uh, where there's, a lot more urban housing than we have here. Um, and they have solutions that I think um, would, usually you're not gonna find them in the garage, you're gonna find them in the unit themselves. And so I think having that flexibility is gonna help us with the housing crisis. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments from commission? Okay, we have a motion on the floor. That motion is to support the staff recommendation, uh, but remove the, uh, at this point, remove the prohibitions on the drive-throughs. Uh, and that motion was made by Commissioner Boomhauer, seconded by Commissioner Malbro. And we'll go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Austin. Aye. Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Malbro. Aye. Commissioner Modane. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. Commissioner Hoffman or Chairman Hoffman is an aye. So that passes unanimously. 
Uh, and with that, um, we have one more item, but uh, I would like to take a short break. And so why don't we, we will reconvene at 10.55. Uh, Chairman Hoffman, is it, is it acceptable for me? I'm gonna need to recuse on the next item. Um, is it acceptable for me to do that recusal now or should I, do I need to wait until we come back? I, uh, I will ask Deputy City Attorney Eckmeyer. I would ask that you wait until we come back and okay. the item is announced. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Okay, we are postponed till 10.55.
Okay, we are we are back. Uh, just make sure um, all the commissioners are back. Uh, the only one I don't see is Commissioner Modane, and we'll just wait a, just a couple seconds. There we go. Okay, so ready to go with item number two is the next item, the Barrio Logan Community Plan Update. And staff, if uh, you'd please go ahead with your presentation. Excuse me. Uh, Chairman Hoffman, I need to recuse on this item. I have um, a client who owns property here and we're currently working on a project. All righty, thank you. I will get off, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chairman Hoffman? Yes. Uh, this is Commissioner Otsuji. I would like to disclose that as a sitting planning commissioner during the first uh, community plan update of Barrio Logan, uh, I attended uh, many of the meetings uh, at, at the community as a observer. Okay, thank you for that disclosure. Uh, and I'm assuming that would meeting would not affect your judgment of this project. That is correct. All right, thank you. All right, staff, please proceed. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I believe we're gonna start with um, some words from our Planning Director, Mike Hansen. Good morning, Chair Hoffman and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, we're pleased to present to you today the Barrio Logan Community Plan Update. This plan represents many years of public engagement and input into shaping the community vision for one of the city's most culturally significant areas. Especially noteworthy here is that this plan is a story of different perspectives coming together and through uh, support of the city, achieving a meeting of the minds to solve issues that once seemed intractable. The Barrio Logan community has a diverse mix of land uses in close proximity, which has created a unique set of challenges to be resolved in the community plan. We're excited to share with you today that through a community-driven planning process, we now have a plan that resolves these long-lasting land use conflicts and has broad public support. The, uh, this plan protects residents which is key to meeting our environmental justice and public health goals. And it also allows the maritime industry to operate in a way that is compatible with those goals and the community vision. The plan furthers the city's general plan and climate action plan goals as well, which will be discussed more fully. And before we move to the presentation, I'd first like to thank several people and organizations for their many hours of hard work and effort that went into the creation of this plan. In particular, I'd like to recognize and thank the Barrio Logan Community Planning Group, its chair, Mark Steele, as well as Diane Takborian and Julie Corrales from the Environmental Health Coalition and Dennis Dubard and Derry Pence from the shipbuilding industry. Uh, without their efforts, we wouldn't be here today. And thank you also to the members of the community at large who participated in this process and made the plan uh, better through your comments. And uh, we look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, we have a presentation that's uh, approximately 20 minutes. My name is Lisa Lind. I'm a senior planner in the planning department. I'm also here with Michael Prinz, program manager, and Tate Galloway, program manager, as well as a team that will be able to answer any questions after the presentation. We are presenting on the Barrio Logan community plan update to request a recommendation of approval to be forwarded to city council. The community planning area is located between downtown Interstate 5 and San Diego Bay. The total area is 1,000 acres and includes Naval Station San Diego and Port Tidelands, leaving approximately 500 acres within the land use authority of the city. And as shown on this slide, the Barrio Lagoon Community Planning Area is also entirely within the coastal zone. Lisa? Yes. Uh, you need to show your slideshow presentation. It's not, it's not being shown. Thank you for letting me know that. Thank you.
I think it's working now. We can see it, yes. Okay, thanks for your patience with that. Um, I am just gonna um, go to the um, previous slide to make sure that we do display the community planning area before I move on. So in updating the community plan, the main goals were to identify land uses consistent with the general plan, address mobility and access to public space, provide design guidance for new development, and celebrate Barrio Logan's arts and culture. The 2021 draft plan built significantly on the 2013 plan, which focused on eliminating residential and industrial conflicts through land use, zoning, and a transition zone, retaining the waterfront's employment role, and establishing a village area with housing opportunities. An important factor has been the timeline to bring forward a plan that resolves the land uses in the current 1978 plan that the community has worked for so many years to address. As discussed in the staff report, the city council adopted a plan in 2013 that was then repealed. The repeal did not include the certified environmental impact report. Recently, key stakeholders met to discuss resolving the conflict that led to the referendum through the creation of a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU. The Barrio Logan Community Planning Group supported the MOU and moving forward on a 2021 draft plan. While the revisions to the plan are primarily focused on the changes in the MOU, the draft plan also incorporates input received during the outreach period over the past year. And the changes are addressed through an addendum to the 2013 Environmental Impact Report. The 2013 plan involved a significant outreach effort, including five years of work by a steering committee and stakeholders. There were public meetings, workshops, and presentations. For the 2021 plan, the renewed engagement effort benefited from having a recognized Barrio Logan Community Planning Group to provide direction and recommendations at regular monthly meetings. Their input was supplemented by an online survey, project website, an online workshop, and materials about the plan were circulated in English and Spanish within the community. Because nearly 75% of Barrio Logan is Hispanic, it was important for the engagement material and events to include Spanish translation to increase participation. When the draft plan was released in September, it was in both English and Spanish. There were additional COVID safe in-person engagement events over the past year with the credit to the work of Pueblo Planning who reached out to several hundred people to talk about the plan update. The full outreach summary included with the planning commission report linked to the audio of the interviews and recordings to hear directly from community members. And most recently, staff held office hours in the community for the final draft. The 2021 draft community plan is consistent with the general plan city of villages strategy. There are 10 elements, each with goals and policies to make this a truly comprehensive plan. Unique to this plan is the incorporation of an arts and culture element that celebrates Barrio Logan's creative, creativity and culture. While there are new policies and content in the 2021 draft plan, it's important to note that community members have been working on environmental justice issues for many years, and there was already a strong foundation to build upon in the 2013 plan. The discussion now addresses health hazards present in the community, the importance of participation in both the process and the decisions for healthy communities. Because the 1978 plan allowed the co-location of industrial and residential uses, the 2013 plan's land use approach added a transition area to reduce conflicts. This approach is strengthened in the 2021 plan with restrictions and use limitations through a combination of policies and regulations. The proposed improvements in the draft plan, along with the city's general plan, help address environmental justice in multiple areas, such as active transportation options within the community, mobility connections to jobs and services, new facilities and infrastructure, access to public space, parks, and healthy foods. The 2021 plan includes the MOU land use changes and provides a thoughtful approach to current and future land uses by addressing the location and operations of industrial and commercial uses and their proximity to residential uses. Like the 2013 plan, the draft plan also proposes to protect and preserve prime industrial lands, 
It promotes a range of residential densities and intensities. It promotes infill and designates a community village center. All of this contribute to the additional capacity for housing as the community grows. As noted in the staff report, there are approximately 1300 housing units in the community with 467 listed as deed restricted affordable units. Build out under the current 1978 plan would allow for approximately 2,700 housing units, while the estimates for the 2021 draft plan show additional capacity for approximately 4,000 total housing units. This is an increase over the 1978 plan and the 2013 plan, and a notable increase of housing within the city's transit priority areas. Barrio Logan is also an important employment area, and so the plan supports an increase in jobs as well. The neighborhood areas established in the 2013 plan are refined in the 2021 plan. The areas described as community village, historic core, transition area, Boston Main Street and prime industrial have specific recommendations and policies that reflect the desired land use, design and issues such as view corridors. These neighborhood areas are coordinated with the landscape districts and the community plan street tree selections. The plan outlines the need to increase the tree canopy for the benefit of the urban forest and the character of the neighborhood areas. The plan also addresses methods for conserving natural resources, reducing pollution, and augmenting its urban environment with community gardens, stormwater measures, and designs that encourage walkable and inviting pedestrian environments. The majority of the plan's approach is carried forward from 2013, and the primary changes as I've mentioned apply to a 65 acre MOU area. The plan also introduces a new community plan implementation overlay zone or CPAWS for Barrio Logan. The February Planning Commission workshop went into detail on the MOU areas that would serve as a transition or buffer between the heavy industrial uses on the residential areas and also prohibit new industrial uses or establishments that generate any form of pollutant or result in air, negative air quality impacts in the community. There were also enhancements to the mobility network and the planned parks based on the engagement period. And so we'll highlight those today as well. The mobility network works in concert with other citywide strategies including the city's climate action plan, in particular, the city, city's goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by increasing non-vehicular mode shares and reducing commute distances, and also programs like Mobility Solutions and Vision Zero. The draft plan proposes an interconnected multimodal circulation system for pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users and motorists who travel within and to and from Barrio Logan. The 2021 community plan includes additional improvements and modifications to the existing right of way to accommodate more users and provide more op options for how people travel. The bike network in particular received helpful input and was refined to include additional bike lanes and for example, separated facilities. Main Street is proposed to be reclassified to provide a protected bike facility that connects to the regional network. And there are new connections to the Choyas Creek bike path and the Bayshore bikeway. One of the community issues is commercial truck vehicles on neighborhood streets and the resulting noise and air quality concerns. There are current commercial vehicle prohibitions on select streets in Barrio Logan. And in response to community input, the updated plan includes revised truck route restrictions that extend on more of the community's neighborhood streets. The regulations as they apply today exempt existing businesses and their truck routes, including to the port. Even with the proposed update, the same exemptions will apply. The new route restrictions would not apply to commercial vehicles for existing commercial and industrial businesses that have origins or destinations in Barrio Logan. New truck traffic will be directed to the perimeter of the community on designated streets to minimize conflicts. Additionally, the mobility element includes traffic calming improvements with um, plans for more regulatory 
and wayfinding signage. With the new network, the pie chart illustrates the change in the community's mode choice for commuters. This is for work-related trips for any time period and not necessarily the peak period. Barrio Logan's future mode share would have active transportation at 24%, transit at 33%, and vehicles at 43%. Today, Barrio Logan is already a VMT or vehicle miles traveled efficient area as the community's average number of trips sorry, a vehicle miles traveled or VMT is less than 85% of the region when we look at a per capita basis. The new land use plan coupled with mobility improvements contributes to even shorter and more efficient trips. These graphs illustrate that the community's VMT per employee and per resident as a percent of base year regional average is below the city's deter CEQA determination. Barrio Logan's VMT for employment uses would be below, and, and residential would be below the impact threshold. Since the 2013 draft, the city's climate action plan was adopted. Therefore, the community plan was reviewed and updated to bring the policies up to date with the recent community plan updates, which strive to increase the use of transit in, TFP, in TPAs or transit priority areas, implement pedestrian improvements for commuter walking opportunities, implement the city's bicycle master plan, as well as the increase in commuter bicycling opportunities and implement transit oriented development. The recreation element also goes beyond what was identified early on and provides additional recreational value and park areas in the community. The element was reviewed to also align the plan facilities with the city's parks master plan. The updated draft includes eight new parks, and when combined with the previously planned parks, will add over 900 recreation value points to Barrio Logan. This represents a doubling of the existing recreational value in the community. And it also considers the existing park upgrades as well as new opportunities for recreation from small parks and pocket parks to community gathering spaces, multi-use paths, trails, and habitat restoration. The recreation element also emphasizes the need for connectivity and access by the development of linear parks and open space connections to community assets like Choice Creek and along Logan Avenue and 26th Street with a series of pocket parks and an active public realm with plazas, performance stages, and public art. These parks would be installed with traffic calming measures to ensure that pocket parks are safe and comfortable for all. The Barrio Logan Community Planning Group has made several important recommendations that shaped the plan before you today. The first major recommendation was the MOU land uses and updated zoning. Following the Planning Commission workshop and the release of the community plan in April, the community also voted to recommend to maintain the residential densities and provide more policies to support its low-income residents. In meeting this summer and into the fall, there was additional input on the need for stronger affordable housing requirements and protect protections for renters and residents that we'll go into detail in the following slides. The plan enhances existing content and policies in the land use, mobility, parks, and conservation element. It would also establish new regulations through a CPAWS and through proposed amendments to the land development code. The supplemental development regulations in the CPAWS are a tool to provide the tailored land use recommendations, the height limits, and other requests such as parks for the new neighborhood village land use designation. It would also provide that connection from the Boston Linear Park to Choice Creek. In addition, the CPAWS would address the request for affordable housing in Barrio Logan. Within the village areas, residential would have a higher inclusionary housing requirement of 15%, compared to the set citywide 10%. New residential development would be able to provide affordable housing offsite, but in the community, it would not have the option to pay the in lieu fee. The community plan update also proposes anti-displacement regulations specific to Barrio Logan in the land development code. And again, 
These would be requirements that are stronger than what's applied citywide. The community plan update increases residential capacity in an urbanized community where housing units are significantly older than the city as a whole. Most of the housing supply is renter occupied and unrestricted market rents are rising faster. Before we review the specific amendments, we want to highlight some of the answers to the question about why the additional anti-displacement regulations are specifically proposed for Barrio Logan. A majority of Barrio Logan's households earn significantly less than the city as a whole. Renter occupied housing units in the Barrio Logan planning area are more likely to experience cost burden and households experience a higher percentage of overcrowding. Therefore, there is support for these stronger measures in Barrio Logan because residents are more vulnerable to displacement and they're likely to have fewer financial resources to cope with housing changes. The additions to the Land Development Code are proposed to the city's existing dwelling unit protection and condominium conversion regulations. The purpose of the dwelling unit protection is to require the replacement of deed restricted and naturally affordable housing units that can be demolished to enable new development. The purpose of the regulations for condo condominium conversions is to require end of tenancy notice and financial assistance to renter households displaced when apartments are converted to condominiums. The amendments to these regulations are intended to provide relocation and replacement housing for tenants in both of these cases, and they're based on the city's stronger complete communities measures. The specific tenant support and relocation assistance are proposed to be extended for residents in Barrio Logan. So compared to the existing regulations, which provide protections for units that are considered affordable within the prior five-year period, the protections are extended for a period of seven years in Barrio Logan. The notice period to tenants in Barrio Logan is also extended from six months to 12 months. And most notably, there would be a requirement that Barrio Logan residents are prioritized for 75% of the on-site affordable units in new development. All in all, there's an effort to preserve the level of existing affordable housing in Barrio Logan, both deed restricted and naturally occurring affordable housing through the higher inclusionary housing requirement and the stronger anti-displacement regulations. The zoning program as part of the community plan update involves rescinding the plan district ordinance and applying citywide zoning to implement the community plan land uses. It would add a C pause to tailor the use regulations that further the environmental justice goals and also address co-location concerns. The supplemental development regulations in the C pause address the transition areas, the new land uses, and also outline the higher inclusionary housing requirement. In addition, staff proposes a supplemental development regulation that would go into the community plans Appendix A as SDR 9. This would reinforce the review of the land development code, dwelling unit protection and condominium conversion regulations for new residential proposed in the community. Last week, the community planning group voted to support the community plan update. This was a vote of 10 1 0. The no vote was a property owner and a board member who has requested a, the allowance of housing on a block that is part of the transition strategy and does not allow housing for the draft plan. City staff requests that the Planning Commission consider the community plan update and its associated documents and provide a recommendation of approval to City Council with the addition of a supplemental development regulation. That concludes staff's presentation. As I mentioned, we do have a full team of staff here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, um, I think before we begin, and uh, I apologize to the Spanish speaking community for my Spanish, but I'm going to repeat the instructions we said before, because this is for newcomers coming in. Um, we are offering live interpretation in Spanish 
during this item. And if you wish to hear the Spanish interpretation, please click the interpretation button at the, right, the bottom right of your Zoom screen and you'll see a globe icon. Uh, if you're joining via the Zoom smartphone app, select your language by clicking more or the three dots in the bottom right corner of your screen. Select language interpretation, then choose Spanish and click done. Uh, if you wish to hear only the interpreters and not the original speakers, be sure to click mute original audio. Uh, everyone has to choose a language, so don't stay in the default off mode. Uh, ahora voy a repetir estas instrucciones en español. Estamos ofreciendo interpretación en vivo en español durante esta reunión. Si desea escuchar la interpretación en español, haga clic en el botón Interpretation, Interpretación. En la parte más bajo derecha de la pantalla Zoom, verá un icono de globo traqueo. Si se está uniendo a través de la aplicación Zoom para smartphone, seleccione su idioma haciendo clic en More, Más, o en tres puntas, puntos en la esquina inferior derecha de la pantalla. Seleccione Language Interpretation, Interpretación del idioma. Entonces escoge Spanish y haga clic en Done, listo. Si desea escuchar solo a, las, a los intérpretes uh, y no a los oradores o originales, asegúrese de hacer clic en Mute Original Audio, Silenciar Audio Original. Todos deben elegir un idioma. No se queda en la posición de apagado predeterminada. Gracias. So with that, we will go into uh, commissioner clarification questions. Uh, are there any clarification questions? Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you. I have two. My first one is for the city attorney. Um, I, I absolutely understand the anti-displacement elements. I think, especially in this neighborhood, it makes a ton of sense. I just want some assurances that the city attorney's office has been through this with a fine tooth comb and that we know that this complies with state and federal fair housing regulations and we're not going to find ourselves getting getting sideways because I, I'm especially worried about the proximity prioritization for 75% because I know when that's been proposed elsewhere it's been subject to legal challenge. Great, yes, great question. I have reviewed all of this in detail and it is in compliance with all state law regulations and federal. And just so that you and, oh, sorry, go ahead. I see you're talking, but I don't know that anybody can hear you. Oh, can anyone hear me? I'm not muted. Yes, I can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Commissioner Boomhauer, can you hear me now? It's getting warbling a little bit, that's all. Getting closer to my computer, I'll yell. I'll be a little louder. Sorry, um, to, sorry to interrupt, but I might suggest that possibly you not, are not in the English channel, and maybe that's why some people are not able to hear. I, I'm not? No, you are, Shannon. Oh, I can hear okay. you, but I okay. think those that can't hear you probably have not selected a, um, a language channel. Which I think is referring to you potentially, Commissioner Blumhauer. Did you? You're in the English. I'm in English, so okay. I don't know. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so I've <clears throat> I've worked closely with staff. Um, this area, Barrio Logan, is unique, uh, more so than other areas in San Diego, with the socioeconomic study that was provided to all of you. Our office did recommend doing that study to determine why the anti-displacement measures and the affordable housing and everything that you're seeing in the C pause and the code update are included for this area to really demonstrate and provide evidence in the record as to why we are being more restrictive in the C pause area and why we are treating this stuff um, differently than everywhere else 
in the city of San Diego. So I am confident that we have enough evidence in the record to show why it's necessary to have these restrictions and requirements. Fantastic. I figured that was the case, but I wanted to make sure we set it out loud. Of course. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. My second clarifying question, Chair Hoffman, uh, is probably for the sustainability department. Um, and it specifically has to do with um, just determining what considerations were made for sea level rise, because I know that this is one of the neighborhoods that that is widely considered by experts to be most subject to the impacts from sea level rise. So I just want to make sure before we adopt this that we we have an understanding of what was studied with regard to that. Commissioner Boomhauer, perhaps I could uh, begin with an answer. Michael Prince, uh, working with Lisa Lind on the plan update. Um, we worked with uh, staff in the CEQA section, as well as with the sustainability department, both in the planning department and the sustainability to evaluate potential impacts to sea level rise, utilizing the appropriate maps and software. Um, most of the impacts that are, were identified over the 50 and 100 year horizon occur largely on port tidelands. Uh, nevertheless, we do have policies uh, that do support um, efforts that would uh, address sea level rise in the conservation element of the plan. And we did coordinate these with the ports efforts as they are looking at improvements to their property as well. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I have, Chair Hoffman. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, Vice Chairman Whalen? Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of clarifying questions. Since so much of the success of this plan hinges on the balance between um, existing residents and what happens in the future, uh, can staff just touch on uh, if they believe the, the replacement of protecting protected dwelling units uh, policy regulation uh, is working in practice today, if, if it's used somewhere else? Uh, how is it that you chose the seven year period versus the five year period? And I guess uh, connected with that is you you have increased the number of residential units uh, in the community plan, uh, presumably to, to support this uh, social effort or social equity effort. Uh, how is it you determine that that's a big enough increase to do the job? And I'll, I'll, I'll wait for other comments later. Does that make sense? In other words, how did, you, how did you decide how many more units you needed to make the policy of protecting existing residents work? Why did you go to five to seven? And then do um, you have experience of this working in practice? So um, we're gonna rely on um, several people to answer the facets of your question, um, Commissioner. Uh, so we did talk about there being a combination of policies and regulations. And um, I'm gonna ask um, Vicki White, another senior planner to also address this. But um, what you're looking at is also based in part on the city's recent adoption of the additional measures through the complete communities. Um, so that is relatively new and I don't know that um, we're gonna be able to answer all of your questions related to the extent to which this is tested. Um, but if I could sort of turn to Vicki White um, as well as Michael Prince to help with the answers to this. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner, for that question. The uh, dwelling unit protection regulations that are currently within the municipal code are required by state law, uh, SB 13, um, I believe it's SB 1333. Um, and they were required for uh, jurisdictions throughout the state of California, but have only been in place for approximately a year. We don't currently have information on how that has been working, but um, as I mentioned, it is a, a requirement across the board throughout the state. And it's something we can monitor going forward. The change of uh, looking to extend the look back period from five years to seven years was a recommendation that was made by stakeholders uh, through the engagement process for the Complete Communities Housing Solution Project in recognition that there has been ongoing change in affordability and rent rates um, in over the past 
um, many years and that looking back a bit farther could capture um, uh, uh, more information on, on historical rent rates uh, during that time period and the, the incomes of the, the households that had been occupying those, um, those units. And so could therefore perhaps uh, capture um, a, a broader picture of the affordability over time. Okay. And Commissioner Boomhauer asked my first question, which was, is this legally legit? So I appreciate that. Thank you. And then the last one was how many units did you decide were needed to make it work? So uh, thank you for that question, Commissioner. Um, it, part of the effort was to build on the 2013 plan, which was approved by council and later rescinded by the voters. Um, when the effort was decided to restart the process, the primary focus was to utilize the 2013 plan as the framework to complete the plan update, with the primary focus being to uh, separate new residential and new industrial uses uh, and address all of the mobility, recreation, conservation, and urban design goals that were approved through the five-year engagement process as part of the 2013 effort. When we presented this information at the Planning Commission workshop in February of this year, uh, one of the questions and comments from the commissioner was to explore additional residential density capacities, including increased density on the proposed on the recycling yard site uh, within the community. Staff did work with the planning group and the community over several months, not only leading up to the planning commission workshop, but also following that including with presenting detailed renderings of what additional residential density could look like. Ultimately, the planning group decided to recommend uh, a residential density framework that was consistent with the 2013 plan. And so the capacity uh, that in, of residential density that is increased in this plan is roughly 1400 units over what is allowed by today's current plan. This does not account for the uh, affordable housing regulations and the complete communities housing solutions regulations, uh, which will be available to applicants uh, and property owners uh, to increase density beyond what the plan allows on specific sites uh, provided those provisions. In short, we really worked to address a variety of goals and work with the community to get a plan that has broad support from a variety of community members and stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, good answer, Mr. Prince. Uh, let's uh, see if there's any other clarification comments. Seeing as none, then we will go ahead into the public testimony portion. Uh, and to begin, uh, just please click on, if you wish to speak on the raised hand, raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I can get a count here. Everyone who would like to speak today. Chairman Hassan. Yes. He has his hand raised. Oh, I did by mistake. Sorry about that. Um, but I see the hand. So what we're going to do, this is going to be a little bit different because we have interpreters uh, and there's going to be some time needed for uh, making sure everyone understands if there's a language barrier. So uh, I'm going to be a little more lax. We're going to allow three minutes each for speakers. Uh, however, I'm not going to hold quite as tightly uh, to the uh, timeline if I feel that there's a need for if interpretation is going on. So, so this will be one of my exceptions. The other thing I'm going to ask is all of the speakers, if they could speak actually very clearly, uh, don't speak too fast so that the interpreters can keep up. So with that, we will go to our first speaker. This is, um, uh, but well, before I begin, staff, is there a presentation from the community group that uh, I see Mr. Steele is here, but is there, um, any pr uh, presentation they were planning? Thank you, Chair oh. Hoffman. Um, the community planning group isn't making a formal presentation with slides, um, but Mark Steele as chair of the 
planning group is here to um, offer some public comment. Okay, Mark, I don't see your hand raised, but I would like to begin with you. Uh, or probably I don't because uh, you're a panelist. So Mark, I, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, and I appreciate the time that you've all spent on this. Um, I have to say that this is a, a very happy day for me, for the planning group and for the community of Barrio Logan. It's been a long time coming. Barrio Logan is, the, is, is a unique multi-generational community. I think you all know that, um, that has suffered for a long time. Um, for many, many years, uh, under the 1978 plan was woefully inadequate and it allowed a lot more sort of degradation in the community. I have to say that I, I would like to comment on Mike Hansen's wisdom and that, that, that is, and that he required before, he required us to prove to him that we could all work together as a community before he would, he would assign staff and the finances to begin to, the, to get this update. So that's when we entered into um, discussions with the Environmental Health Coalition, the Working Waterfront, and the planning group. And it took us quite a while to do that, but it resulted in a, 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 the MOU that resolved all the issues around the transition zone, which was the big sticking point. So the transition zone was the place where we started. Having that behind us and having that settled allowed the community group along with the EHC and other organizations and the, and the waterfronts uh, continued involvement to really focus on making the plan better. And this plan, this 2021 plan is significantly better than the 2013 plan. Uh, and I think you all have just even been discussing why it is. It's, it's, it's better for the residents. It's, there's tenant protections. There's a lot more in here. There's a lot more environmental issues. There's, there's uh, the, the truck routes are a very, very big deal. Uh, to this community as is the housing. So, so this is a happy day. It's a better plan. And I want to thank all of you. I really want to thank Michael Prince, by the way, who, who shepherded us this through. He sat in many, many meetings. Uh, and Lisa Lynn, who came in and, and has done a, a, an, an amazing job uh, helping us move this project forward, this, this the plan forward. You can see it by her presentation today. It's, I think it's a cutting edge community plan for the city of San Diego. And so we've come a long way from uh, the 1978 plan, which I refer to as like a Houston plan, you can do anything anywhere you want to, all the way up to a plan that really does have a vision and will protect those, those wonderful multi-generational people that live in Barrio Logan. Um, I'd like to also thank all of the staff that's been involved in this, many of which we really didn't uh, have, have a direct connection with, but, but all the people that were working on the plan itself. It's been a great experience. The planning group is happy. Um, we hope you'll all come to Barrio Logan and see us <laughs> and enjoy what, what is coming forward. So I, I have to take it from the, um, just the few questions you had, which were intelligent questions, some of which that we had ourselves, uh, that there's pretty good support for this plan. So I'm hoping that that support is true, that I'm reading it, and that you will, you will move this matter on to the city council, because we'd like to get the plan done. Uh, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, it's time is of the essence in this community. And, uh, and we, we hope that you will take action today and we'll move it forward and get through the council by the end of the year. So thank you all very much um, here. If anybody has any questions, uh, if not, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Steele. Thank you for all of your effort and commitment. So the whole community, I'm sure, and we appreciate that a lot. Uh, okay, Jennifer Case. And Jennifer, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I do have some other um, friends on this call who have ceded time to me. Um, I, I will try to go very quickly, though. Um, am I able to show a slide or two? Uh, uh, Jennifer, first of all, um, and I'll stop your time, who... who how much time do you need and, and who is ceding their time to you? Um, just one second. I've got Terry Wigglesworth and Jim Bartell uh, who have both given me their three minutes and I can do it within those nine minutes. Okay. I believe there are three others as well, but I don't think I'm going to need that much time. Okay, sounds good. Go, please go right ahead. We'll start now. Okay, so just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Case. I am the founder and president of New Leaf Biofuel. We are a biodiesel uh, company that makes uh, 
biodiesel, which is an eco-friendly alternative to diesel fuel. We are located in Barrio Logan. We've been there for about 15 years. I started the company um, back in 2006 with a mission to uh, transform uh, the way this city uses uh, uh, diesel and instead replace it with biodiesel. And that's exactly what we've done over the last 15 years. Um, the biggest problem I have um, with this community plan update uh, is how it's going to affect our ability to continue to provide this ultra low carbon um, biodiesel fuel into the community, which is doing um, really great things for the environment. Um, the number one problem that was identified um, in the uh, in, with the plan uh, planning group and the environmental health coalition in discussing the Barrio Logan community is the health problems related from diesel emissions, uh, pre uh, predominantly from heavy duty diesel engines. Uh, my, our company produces 12 million gallons of biodiesel each year, uh, and those uh, that fuel is uh, results in an 80 percent uh, less carbon intense fuel uh, that's used directly in diesel engines. Uh, it also, on top of the carbon emissions, provides a significantly less um, particulate matter, carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbons. Uh, these emissions uh, uh, have a great impact on addressing the global warming things that it will take decades uh, for us to do um, with electricity, we are doing right now in the community. Uh, there's been studies that show that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the criteria pollutants um, for biodiesel result in a 72% reduction in cancer risk uh, when heavy duty trucks such as semis use um, renewable fuels. Uh, there's less asthma attacks and there's less sick days for employees when they're using fuels uh, like biodiesel. Um, we are, um, you know, very supportive of the community plan. Um, other than uh, our particular plant, we believe that we are a solution to the problem. Uh, yet we are smack dab right in the middle of the uh, rezone. Uh, this is going to get in the way of our plans to continue to be um, a, a fuel that can help with the climate action plan, uh, the ports. Um, uh, uh, update for um, the port emissions that they're working on. Uh, so we really don't want to have to stop what we're doing or reduce um, the uh, impacts of what we're doing because what we're doing is good for the environment. Under the new plan, uh, we will be prevented from um, expanding our business um, beyond exactly what it's doing right now, uh, which would, uh, as any business owner could probably tell you, is um, stagnating a business is essentially putting a nail in the coffin of that business. Uh, so we're really um, worried about the impacts on our um, employees, uh, impact on our community. Uh, so, you know, we we understand that uh, the goal uh, of both the climate action plan and the state of California with the low carbon fuel standard is to um, eventually move to an, a completely electric economy. Uh, I 100 percent support that. I have a uh, electric car myself and uh, I love it. Uh, I would I, I really I haven't been to a gas station in years and, and I love that. Uh, but unfortunately, we're looking at a situation with the heavy duty diesel transport fleet, specifically the good move, goods movement in and out of the port um, here in San Diego and in other ports in California, where heavy duty diesel vehicles are going to continue to run fossil fuels uh, unless and until we provide them with an alternative that is um, an ultra low carbon fuel. And that's what new leaf um, biofuel produces. Uh, so in, in the time transition that it's going to take to move uh, from uh, an all diesel, heavy diesel move or heavy goods movement um, company or uh, economy to electrification, New Leaf's fuel is a bridge fuel and we wanna be able to continue what we're doing. So we are asking uh, that New Leaf be exempt until that time uh, about 2045, which is about when we think that um, electrification of the heavy duty diesel fleet uh, will happen. Uh, we wanna be revised from the, uh, or uh, exempt from the rezone designation in this plan, which would not allow us to expand to produce more gallons of fuels. Uh, without us being there, uh, recycling the cooking oil from the area restaurants, uh, this local resource would be would leave San Diego also by heavy duty diesel truck and it would be going to other communities to help reduce the um, air quality effects of diesel pollution. So I believe we should stay. I believe we should be allowed to continue to expand our business and um, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victoria McMullen.
I'm dedica dedicating my time to Jennifer Case. Uh, she already spoke. You don't have to if you want to say something. No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy Cruz. Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Nancy Cruz and I am a resident of uh, a Logan resident and I'm, ha I'm happy to be here today to express my support for the community plan update. Uh, I have been following the plan update for months as um, I've seen the community, uh, the community plan group and uh, the city uh, have worked uh, tirelessly to bring forth the plan uh, you're being presented here today. Uh, my family and neighbors are constantly um, dealing with respiratory uh, complications due to various sources of toxin. So I am especially happy with the great advances we have in the plan, including the transition zone that creates a buffer zone between industry and residential areas. In addition, setting truck routes helps to further minimize exposure of diesel pollution um, in uh, in close proximity to, um, to houses and our community has carried the burden of suffering from pollution generated um, by the port and it is essential that our community plan include truck routes. I urge you to support this plan which is reflective of the partnership between the community and the city to improve conditions in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nancy. Dennis Dubard. And Dennis, don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, how's that? Sounds good. We can good hear. Good morning, you. Chair Oppen and Commissioners. Again, my name is uh, Dennis Dubard, and I am representing the Ship Repair Association and the Working Maritime Waterfront Group. So we are very supportive of this plan, and as Mark Steele indicated earlier, we are part of the team that came together to to, to hash out this plan and move forward from the 2013 plan. So we came together as part and worked out through the MOU. Uh, the key component of that MOU is from our perspective is the creation of that transition zone and the buffer zone between the residents and the industrial waterfront, which does not allow for residents in that area. The community plan clearly protects the residences and the business, and we are very supportive. I'd like to give a big thanks to Mark Steele, Diane Tackborin, Julie Corrales and Josie Talamentes and Filomeno Marino, who we worked with uh, on the planning group, as well as Mike Hansen, Michael Prince and Lisa. They were did a tremendous job uh, and were very professional in moving this forward. And I would say that the city is in really good hands with this team. And I strongly request that you endorse this plan and send it on to city council. Thanks a lot, really appreciate it. Okay, Dennis, thank you. Lori Saldana. Good morning, and um, it's actually Lori Saldana. I am the former assembly representative for the city of San Diego and was chair of the, the assembly housing and community development committee. And as someone who has reviewed uh, plans at the state level, it always troubled me when I would look at Barrio Logan and realize that they were denied the opportunity to have this type of plan for so long. So I want to just uh, say that it's encouraging to see the community finally have uh, an opportunity to develop uh, a better community for themselves and for future generations. And we know that about a third of, of San Diego residents are, are Latino, according to the latest census estimates. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Latinas are, are among the lowest paid workers in the United States. And for the community of Barrio Logan, when we hear them express concerns over gentrification and displacement, um, it's absolutely on point. This is a community that historically has uh, had lower wage jobs. And that means that families are less able to invest in education for themselves and their family and their children, and also to pay for things like health care, child care, and housing. So I think adding affordable housing and protecting available housing, um, uh, trying to avoid the impacts of displacement on, on these families is especially important. It's, it's critical. Um, I, I'm also, I just wanted to speak a bit about the process. I have not participated in a planning commission hearing for many years. Uh, when I look at the demographics of the city of San Diego and I compare it to the planning commissioners, um, I'll just say things need to need to change. Um, 
in San Diego, almost half of our population are women and one third are Latino. And when we look at the makeup of the demographics of the planning commission, it's really uh, hard to, to see a match between uh, the diversity and equity that we see in our city and the diversity um, uh, on the planning commission. And so I hope that going forward, uh, you know, ultimately uh, lived experience does matter. And when planning commissioners are making determinations about how these community plans are developed, who they impact, how they lift organ, uh, communities into a higher level of safety and public health, it does help to have experienced some of that in, in your own lived experience. So I, I look forward to seeing this plan uh, advance and I'm happy that the residents have had an impact. I encourage them to stay engaged, stay involved. Um, and as I've told the city council, I would love to see the city hire and appoint more diversity um, in contracting and in other ways, because that's the only way we're going to move our entire city ahead um, and lift all boats, as the saying goes, uh, to make these communities or enable our, our families to uh, invest in their communities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, and apologize for the pronunciation. The tilde doesn't show up on the Zoom list here, so apologize for that. Okay, here we go to Hernan and Rachel, who's ever speaking. Could you please give your full name? And uh, don't forget to unmute. Good afternoon, Chairman Hoffman and commissioners. Thank you very much for taking the time to see this. Again, I would like to echo the fact that Mark Steele, Michael Prince, Diane Tecmoria, they've done a phenomenal job representing this group and are trying to assess and accommodate all the different wishes. I would like to say that we have several people here that would like to cede their time, Chairman. They are uh, okay. Adam Jacobs, we've got Melissa Morales, and I trust in fact, sir. <laughs> Hernan, could you uh, give your full name again? I didn't catch that. Yes, sir. It's very, very difficult because I, I am a Latino and it is very difficult. My first name, sir, is Hernan. That's H-E-R-N-A-N. -N. So okay. Hotel Echo Romeo, November, Alpha, November. My last name is even harder, sir. It's three words. Luis E. Prado. That's Lima Uniform. India, Sierra, space, Y as in Yankee, space, P as in Papa, Romeo, Alpha, Delta, Oscar, Luis, Prado. And, and how, how, and Hernan, how much time do you, do you need? I would like six to nine minutes, sir. Okay, and you have, uh, so you'll need um, two speakers. Yes, sir. Melissa Morales and Justin Fax, sir. Okay. And Justin, who was that? Back. F A C K. Sure. Got it. Okay. Uh, we'll start now. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. The Barrio of the Community Plan that we have seen has some very interesting factors in it. And I agree with is a much needed refresh of a plan that we've been working on for a long time. Mark Steele, Diane Warrior, Michael Pence, Dennis DeBord have done a phenomenal job. With that, there are a couple things that I'd like to point out and make sure that we address. For over 11 years, we have been seeing what's been happening to the neighborhood and seeing how constant um, issues continue to resurface. And my question is, we complain about low median incomes in San Diego, particularly in Barrio Logan. What are we doing to change that? And what I'd like to share with you is in 2011, when David Alvarez drove me around in his vehicle to figure out where we could expand our training operation and our company, because you'll be happy to know that San Diego is home to Vet Powered LLC. And as a three-time combat veteran for the US Navy, when I came back from overseas, there was nothing for my neighbors and my comrades in arms to do that would get them out of poverty. And we started create a, an advanced manufacturing company based right here on Main Street, San Diego, that was just named 
the veteran owned business of the year for the entire United States of America. And we are based right here on Main Street. And we've been expanding to 350 times our original footprint. We provide training and employment for our neighbors, as well as housing for our employees. And we have the same issues that our neighbors have. We have an unsafe community and we have created lighting, installed lighting posts, fixed buildings, fixed fences. To make it healthier, we have replaced all of our gasoline and diesel vehicles with electric vehicles. But that brings about another concern. How do you power all these vehicles? And to do so, you need to have faster reporting requirements and faster acceptance through different processes to include at the Barrio Logan Community Planning Group. How do we make a healthier and safer community if we don't build in the infrastructure to do so? So if we want a healthier community, which includes diesel particulate matter that's going from the five as well as from the port, but we don't do anything to increase diesel fuel elimination, for example, by increasing the amount of biodiesel fuel that gets generated in our own community, or by including in the plan specific places for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. You know, as they said before, right, hope is not a strategy. How do we incorporate that into our plan to make sure that we're able to, to offer a healthful and safer solution for our neighbors? That part offers robotic training. We teach 3D printing, manufacturing, design. We incorporate turnkey solutions for companies like Facebook, Tesla, Boeing, SpaceX. None of our employees make minimum wage. The median salary for our employees is double. And we are looking to grow. This is our community. It takes a very long time for a small business such as ours to be able to expand. So we would ask to be exempt from this plan because we would like to grow. We would like to make our neighbors and employees wealthier so that they can contribute to the community. They can buy houses in the community. They can build up houses for the community. By increasing their median incomes, they will be able to do so. By wringing their hands, they will not. And the current restrictions on compressed air the current restrictions on building put a significant hamper on our ability to expand, to provide greater opportunities for our neighbors, and to provide better economic outlooks, not only for our neighbors, not only for our employees, but for the San Diego area. Our goal is that 150 years from now, people will look back and they will see that San Diego and Vet Powered were the birthplace for America's green manufacturing renaissance. The nation is starved for talent and for advanced manufacturing technologies like battery technologies, artificial intelligence, and robotic automation. This is what we do right here on Main Street San Diego. And we would really, we would request that that power be exempt from the plan and that we be allowed to expand our facilities in San Diego, sir. Okay, is that it? Thank you. Yes, it is, sir. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Luis y Prado. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. I am also um, with Vet Powered and Workshops for Warriors. And as our non stated, we have been living and working um, and building in Barrio Logan for the last 11 years. Um, I have attended all the Barrio Logan planning uh, meetings, but I did want to point out that on page 11 of the community plan update, um, the residents, right, residences and businesses off of Main Street were not actually um, outreach to and given notice of the plan update. Uh, we did hear about it word of mouth but uh, I do feel like it's a kind of a systematic problem if you're gonna change the zone and not give notice to the people who are gonna be affected. I will say that um, changing the zone will um, stagnate our organizations and we do provide training, certification and job placement to um, veterans, including individuals from Barrio Logan. 
We hire staff in Barrio Logan. We want to grow and hire more. Being able to work in your own neighborhood is a luxury that Barrio Logan rarely has had. And the ability, and which reduces many of the issues that the neighbors talk about, which every other part of this plan, I am in 100% in agreement. 100%, I agree with that. But to change something that's been mixed use for so long, that's been working and actually improving the neighborhood, I feel is um, um, something that we should consider strongly before making that vote. That's all. All right, thank you. Uh, Philomena Marino. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, my, I am Philomena Marino. I reside at South 32nd and Boston Avenue for half a century. Majority of my neighbors have been owner occupied residents for over 60 years. We, my neighbors and I would like to thank the planning staff for including the transition zone and strengthening the truck route in the community plan. We echo Mark Steele's praises, especially for all those behind the curtain. If you would like to take a virtual visit to Barrio Logan, please Google 1208 South 32nd Street, just to show you a little corner of our community. Why is this transition zone and the stronger route so important for our community? Our, when I say our, I'm talking about the residents. I'm speaking about the businesses. I'm speaking about the San Diego Port District. I'm not just referring about my little home, my little business. It's the whole entire community of Barrio Logan. Health, safety, noise, right to own property as it meets the essential needs of decent living and to help maintain the dignity of the individual and of the home. Together with a few of my senior neighbors, we collected data, truck counted, and we proposed a solution that worked for businesses, the port district and the residents we considered the following, safety for the drivers, the cargo, safety for pedestrians and the residents, safety for Navy and personnel due to close proximity, fuel consumption reduction for trucks and proposed truck routes, reduced exposure to diesel emissions, alleviate current health conditions such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and many more ailments that both the children and my elderly neighbors are struggling with daily, reduce noise decibel exposure, and then considering the upcoming port district growth with a thousand trucks daily. And we considered existing businesses. The optimal route benefits both the business, benefits businesses, Navy, residents, and other San Diego port employees. Proposed new plan does not inhibit any exist, existing businesses. Existing businesses are aware they are nestled among homes, apartments, and senior communities. I would hope that expanding businesses would ethically consider health and their social responsibility of the residents next door. You have just heard exception requests with keywords, wealthier, stagnating growth, expand, building, I, R, mixed use for so long and it working for the neighborhood. We weren't included. My father was a Navy veteran, worked in the Port District and it's did his best to protect me, my siblings, grandchildren, and his neighbors before lung cancer took him home. I kindly request that the community plan is not modified so that my elderly neighbors that are still remain may be able to enjoy sitting on the front porch and the children may enjoy playing on the street like most of us might have a memory in of our childhood. Please do not modify the plan. The community's health is at stake we kindly request. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maritza Garcia. Hello, my name is Maritza Garcia and I am a Logan Heights resident. I'm actually second generation here. I uh, firstly wanna extend my support for the community plan and express immense gratitude for all the time that the planning department and the city has taken to listen to the voices of us community members and the changes you have made to protect our residents. That transition zone that will ensure that the buffer from residential properties and industry will positively affect the current health problems many of us face and the 15% affordable units will help ensure that less of our community members must leave their neighborhood, to name a few of the good improvements. My neighborhood has had to put up with a lot over the decades and changes like this make me hopeful for the future of our community. 
I wanted to kind of uh, second what Filomena was saying that um, the industry that is talking are only talking about the last 10 to 15 years. Like I said, I'm second generation. My mother grew up here and she's had to deal with a whole bunch of surgeries for respiratory issues. This is not an issue that has only been here for the past 10 to 15 years. It's been here for decades. And as some of the industry said, they weren't aware of the changes being made. We were never given a choice for this industry to come and be our neighbors. We were forced to have to live through this and we're forced to have to deal with the consequences. So I agree with uh, Filomena and not changing, making any amendments. The way that the plan is, it's to ensure that our safety and our health is improved. The ones who live here, the ones that have to deal with this daily. So I appreciate all the hard work and the collaborations that have been taking place to get us this far. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Julie Corrales. Uh, hello, uh, commissioners. Uh, thank you for, for having us here. My name is uh, Julie Corrales. I'm uh, with the Environmental Health Coalition. I'm also a resident of Barrio Logan. I live, work, I play here. I love this community. Um, I want to quickly say thank you to the shipbuilding industry, shipbuilding industry the community planning group, and um, the planning department to help us get through the MOU process and to get us all here today. Um, I especially want to thank community. Uh, EHC has been working with community for nearly two decades to develop and pass this plan. As you're all aware, we went through the heartbreaking referendum process that was a real disillusionment um, to the community. We were the only community in San Diego to have the entire city opine on their plan. Um, essentially ripping away from us our self-determination to decide what our community looks like. But the plan that's uh, before you today builds Whoa. off that 2013 community plan. Um, it strengthens the transition zone. It's stronger now. Um, it really divides industry from residents. Um, it's, it strengthens uh, the truck route, which is constantly violated now and needs to be strengthened. Um, we see diesel trucks and full-size semis drive by our homes. They drive by in front of my home full-size semi trucks in front of my home on the daily, several times a day. They pass in front of Perkins Elementary School. I see children maneuvering around them. It's important um, to, to make uh, to keep these protections in the plan that, that's before you today. Um, the plan works hard to remedy uh, environmental hazards that we've had to face due to historical racist land use policies. Um, and this plan really demonstrates the city's commitment to preserve um, the historical and cultural gem that is Barrio Logan by prioritizing uh, residents' health over industry profits. Um, I'm gonna get really real with you guys. Uh, New Leaf Biofuel, the work that they do is good and it benefits the you know, city as a whole and the region, but the negative effects of their business uh, and especially any increase in, their, increase in their footprint would once again place the burden of industry on a low income community of color. Um, we should mention that they are allowed to increase their business by 20%, which is not a tiny amount under this plan but they actually want to increase their plan much, much more. I don't know if you guys have seen their plans, but they want to potentially take over several blocks, blocks that uh, could use to house, be used to house future generations, provide parks, green space, storefronts for small business. Um, any increase in their business will bring more trucks, trucks that are not zero emission um, and compound the severe issues that we have with air quality here. Um, making an exemption for New Leaf would perpetuate these racist land use policies that we're talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it would affect us for years to come. This community has been fighting separate for separation from industry and clean air for decades. If uh, Ms. Case had attended any planning group meeting prior to the update, they would have known our issues um, and they could have made different decisions around their expansion plans, but they've never checked in with community, although they're uh, located directly across the street from home. Um, Vet Power has attended every single meeting during our process and has never once raised the issue of an exception for their business. This is the first time I hear about it. Um, asking for this at this very late hour when most community members cannot attend and in fact have every reason to believe that Power supports the plan as is, is extremely ingenuous, disgenuous, um, at the least. So um, I ask the Planning Commission to um, approve this plan with any, without any changes or exemptions to the land use designations or the truck route. I also want to praise the city planning department for what they, the measures they put in, the policies and regulations to address uh, gentrification and displacement. This is of the greatest concern for residents. Um, thank, thank you, Julie. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is calling in by phone. The last four digits are 6561. 
Uh, if you could state your state your full name, please. Hello. Uh, Wait, they'll, they'll announce you. Can you uh, could you start again, ending in six five six one? Start with your full name. Yeah, are you talking to David Dewey? Uh, I see a phone number ending in six five six one. Is yeah, okay. Tough? My name is yeah, my name is David Dewey, D U E A, and I own a business and the property at 2190 and 2146 Main Street. I was the one no vote at a, on the committee and I've been on the committee since the, the first one started in uh, 06. Uh, I love the area and I love the plan except for one thing. The uh, well my original property was taken by the ballpark, so I've been here over 20 years. And I, and I own the property and the business, and I support the plan 100%, except I want one change from Evans to Sampson on the dry side to allow business below, housing above. And I said, they, the committee said we couldn't do that because the urgency of the plan, if we change anything, then we'd have to change everything. And But you have some uh, some amendments they went through you know, I employ 30 people here and I collect a significant amount of sales tax. We're, we're on the dry side from uh, Evans to Sampson. So all I'm asking for is one word change to allow housing someday. I'm not going to do it now, but someday to work above, below and live above. And you could walk to work, the shipyards. We're located on one side, there's multifamily. On the other side, there's an architecture college. We're close to bus stops. We're close to the trolley stops two blocks from community college and we're a perfect area that the governor and the mayor want to allow housing and be able to walk or bicycle to work. So all I want is one word change someday to allow housing on the dry side of Maine from Evans to Sampson. That's my request. And the urgency has been the reason that the committee wouldn't, uh, wouldn't allow me to, to make that change or I uh, made motion several times, but got no support. So I hope you'll support this for the reasons I suggested. And thank you very much. Okay, David, thank you. Uh, Jenna Little. Hello, good afternoon. I would like to cede my time to Keisha Javis Jones. I'm sorry, to who? Ms. Keisha Davis Jones. Okay, um, I do not see, oh, I see her now. Well, when it's her turn, just stay on and then she can uh, accept your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Janelle and Janelle, would you please give your full name? Hi, my name is Janelle Watchman. Okay, please begin. Okay. I've been a Barrio Logan resident for over nine years. I'm a single mother to three young boys, they're six, nine, and 12. And I'm in support of Workshop for Warriors and Vet Power. For the last four years, they have changed my community drastically. I live at 1220 South 30th Street, which for the Barrio neighborhood Logan would know that that was next door to a bar named Carbo Wobble. And my experience from that was unfortunate. Every night for the first five years, there would be drunk and disorderly patrons from that bar physically fighting and causing damage to my vehicle and homes. They've even broke my windows with full bottles of beer when my children were sleeping. Not to mention that this same bar had bikini car washes every Friday night with women scantily dressed in and they would turn into a prostitution ring after night. And I would not allow my children to play outside in our own yard due to the homeless population that would encamp in the empty lot behind my home. They would defecate through drugs, alcohol, urinate. They would even throw feces into my yard, leaving their trash behind. And they would break into my yard, steal my children's bikes, scooters, and even our clothing off our clothing line that we would drive. I had multiple complaints with the bar and local law enforcement and nothing helped. And I, Luis E. Prado, introduced himself to me once he bought the company Kabu Wabu and transitioned it into the Workshop for Warriors program. With that, Workshops for Warriors had installed cameras and lighting in the facility and reduced crime immediately. 
they covered the graffiti that covered my house and my walls that my landlord didn't even cover up. As a result of that, the homeless population has disappeared behind my house. My kids are able to play without being feared they're going to be abducted. And during the pandemic, I have been an active recipient of their free monthly food bank distributions to Barrio local community. I have seen the students and workers sweep and collect trash around the area every morning. They even removed used condoms from the ground that has nothing to do with them at all. I can see that they're trying to improve the community and the work for us. I have now worked for Workshop for Warriors for three years. They offered me a job when I had nothing. And I'm severely grateful that they were willing to take a chance on me, my children, and the neighbors. So I'm in full support of Workshop for Warriors um, that power to modify the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Porfiero Gonzalez. Uh, good morning. My name is Porfirio Gonzalez. Please begin. Uh, I'm from Springfield, Ohio, and I joined the Marine Corps straight after high school and served for five years honorably. Upon my release from active duty, uh, I would have been homeless and searching for work. If Workshop for Warriors had not provided me a chance to redirect myself, uh, they have uh, made, I apologize, they provide me a chance to redirect myself. Since joining their course, the staff has made me a believer of their mission to rebuild America's manufacturing workforce, one veteran at a time. Many of my fellow students are in similar situations and need to build skills needed to be competitive in today's workforce. Not only do they provide me uh, and us with the tools, knowledge, and, prof and professionalism, they provide students who are struggling after our lessons, uh, access to a food pantry and as well as affordable housing for those who can't afford. Workshop for Warriors provides the local area. Uh, so Workshop for Warriors provides the local area with a source of revenue and security. Uh, w, they do that by handing out t-shirts to the students with their logo printed large on the back of their shirts. Uh, whether the students are sweeping the surrounding sidewalks, eating lunch at local shops, or purchasing tools, uh, these businesses and locations are aware of the school's mission and appreciate the security of regular foot traffic of students. I would like to say thank you to Workshop for Warriors for giving me a chance and changing my goals. I would like to become a resident of the local area and work full-time as a welder. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Randall's Galaxy, but uh, could you give us your full name? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah, my name is Randall Erkvitz, and I'm an employee here at Workshops and Vet Powered LLC. I've been a student and affiliated with this organization for since 2014. I began as a student. Some of my past background, um, I was a felon, and I had a substance abuse issues, and any time in life, that I tried to find some meaningful employment and break out of that cycle, it was impossible until I uh, became affiliated with this organization. They did not, were not concerned with my background, but they were concerned in how they could help me. Uh, when I started as a student, they were able to get me a stipend so that I was able to li you know, live and support myself and pay well, I was able to study. They provided me with a laptop where I was able to work on MasterCam and SolidWorks, CAD and CAM software for the machining industry. <clears throat> Upon uh, graduation, I became a teaching assistant. And ever since then, I mean, they provided me with a, a meaningful life and a meaningful career. And I've helped uh, 
hundreds and hundreds of students be, you know, become qualified machinists and move on to a life where they have a quality of life now and a career path that is more than just exciting. It's something that's really viable and tangible. So uh, I am totally in support of WFW and Vet Powered. Uh, everything that we do for this community, we do more than just train veterans. We have a strong presence in this community. I personally have been on many Saturday trips where we have cleaned up the neighborhood block by block, alley by alley. Uh, we have a food bank system where we hand out food and assist neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood uh, people that are low income or they can't eat, we hand, we hand out food. So we are a definite asset to this community. And the pressing need for qualified, skilled manufacturing industry personnel, whether it be welders or machinists, is it's the most important, one of the most important things going on right now that America needs to stay strong in the manufacturing and industry. And that's what we do is we fill those positions that need to be filled, not only just for San Diego, but for the country as a whole. So I like I said before, I would really like to say that you please reconsider the situation for workshops for warriors. We are, what we do is critical to the health of this nation. And uh, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to me and thank you. Uh, thank you, Randall. Let's see, uh, Elizabeth Ocampo Vivero. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Ocampo Vivero. I'm director of Fine and Urban Design at MW Steel Group. Prior to joining MW Steel, I worked as a community planner in the City of San Diego Planning Department and had the honor to serve as the planner assigned to the Barrio Logan community. I fully support this draft of the Barrio Logan Community Plan. For the last few years, I have seen firsthand the need for this update and for the applicable zoning to be updated as well. And I have also seen firsthand all the hard work from the Barrio Logan Community Planning Group and city staff, specifically the City of San Diego Planning Department. I commend and applaud the agreement that was reached between the Barrio Logan Community Planning Group, the Shipbuilding and Ship Repair Industry, and the Environmental Health Coalition through the MOU. I look forward to the approval of this plan and associated zoning, which are so important for the present and future of the Barrio Logan Community. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, Al, um, Ali Fenn. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Uh, well, good morning, commissioners. My name is Alejandra Fenn, um, and I'm the Logan Community Organizer for Environmental Health Coalition. Uh, firstly, I do want to thank the staff of the planning department for listening to the community's concerns about how their health is affected by pollution and including the transition zone and the strength and truck route in the community plan. As you can imagine, um, an unpredictable time between 930 and noon on a Thursday morning is not the most convenient for working class folks to keep themselves available to comment at a meeting like this. So because many community members couldn't make it today um, and a few wanted to comment but have had to leave by now um, and were not even aware that Workshop Warriors and New Leaf would be asking for exemptions today, I did wanna share some direct quotes from comments that were made at the Barrio Logan Planning Group during the process of updating the community plan that speak to the importance of the transition zone and a stronger truck route. Um, one community member said, um, Jezebel Lara said, my household struggles with allergies that got 10 times worse when we moved here. I have cystic fibrosis and it got worse too. If industry is allowed to expand or build closer to us, there will be more illnesses, kids would get sick more and babies would be born with more disabilities. That's why we need a buffer zone between houses and industry. Engelberto Macias said, a few of my siblings had to go to the ER a couple times growing up because of the health issues they had from all the pollution. I lived in a zone right next to industry and I saw those effects on my health and my families. So I don't want other people to go through that. We have to mitigate these kinds of effects with more distance between residential and industrial areas. A buffer zone without residences is important because children shouldn't grow up with lung development problems just because it's more profitable for polluters to build next door to them. Carla Monsivais said, I see so many semi-trucks roaming around Logan on streets where people live. 
I've had enough. I have a cousin that lives here in my apartment complex who has asthma and it's not fair. She's breathing in all the diesel particles generated by these trucks. We didn't choose to live here. Why should my community be affected while other ones such as La Jolla have clean, breathable air? This is why we have to keep these trucks off our streets. And there were so many other comments like this throughout this process. As you can see, there was a clear reason why these policies are as they stand. The work many businesses like Workshop for Warriors and New, Leaf, and New Leaf does is wonderful on the macro scale of the city as a whole, right? But it doesn't justify expansion of industrial uses in a poor, Brown community that's already in the 95th percentile of cancer risk nationwide. Please don't make any concessions to industry in interests and pass the plan unscathed today. As one community member put it, this plan should benefit people who inhabit the neighborhood and protect them. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is John Alvarado. Uh, John, don't forget to unmute, and we'll start when you start speaking. How about now? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, my, uh, my name is John Alvarado. I am the founder and executive director of the Good Neighbor Project San Diego here on Logan Avenue. I was born across the street 71 years ago, and my family's been here well over 100 years. That being said, Barrio Logan is very different than it was when I was a young man. My whole thing has always been core values, education, and at the end of the day, you got to have a good job. The shipyards have always provided good jobs. Now, I understand there are aspects to all of this that uh, have produced uh, much of our uh, uh, air quality, and it is what it is. Now that we know what it is, we can correct it, or at least that's the plan. My biggest concern right now is um, with AB 617, and that is we have literally thousands of individuals who are affected, not just here in Barrio Logan, but all the way down uh, the, the coast, all the way to Imperial Beach. My concern is, is that we might be going down a path that seems to be good, but at the same time will not completely satisfy what's needed for our seniors and for our children. Uh, many of the units that have been proposed, uh, from what I understand, is good for uh, a 10 by 10 uh, uh, bedroom, uh, but then what do you do uh, if you've got not only uh, working class families with four or five kids, several bedrooms, it's not gonna do much for them. I'm in the process right now. In fact, uh, I met with some folks yesterday to discuss the possibility of being able to expand the program. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of people who are absolutely unable to pay for anything uh, in terms of uh, air quality. What I am suggesting is that just like the airport years ago had all this noise pollution and they replaced all the windows uh, of homes facing uh, the airport, I believe that for those people who need medical equipment like myself should be able to either get some kind of medical equipment exemption uh, off of my state tax. And because we also live in a strategic port there should be monies available from the federal side to be able to help many of us residents who live here. I live three blocks from the water. I have a machine that I have to sleep with and every couple of weeks, it has this grayish blackish soot in my machine. Uh, it doesn't filter out everything, but it does a better job than nothing at all. Okay. That being said, I would like the, John, John if you could uh, please uh, wrap it up. Go ahead. Oh, John, I'm sorry. You've been muted. I apologize. I wanted to give you one more sentence to wrap it up, but uh, we'll move on to David, uh, David Alvarez.
And uh, hello. There we go. Hi, Good. commissioners. Thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. I'm actually in Barrio Logan right now, uh, where I spend most of my time living here in Logan. Um, I want to speak, uh, let you know, first of all, that late yesterday I submitted a letter regarding my comments, which uh, are requesting that you add something that I think will be uh, fairly uh, simple and also uh, uh, welcome by the community. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of uh, Reconnect Logan, which is an effort to build a freeway lid over the five freeway. Um, a freeway lid or a cap, as is known, is happening in cities uh, like uh, Portland, Seattle, Dallas, I've had a chance to visit them. Uh, these are uh, infrastructure projects that have helped uh, create some uh, a more balanced community by increasing park space, for example, in park deficient communities like Barrio Logan and Logan Heights. Not to mention the historical context of this in the 1950s when the highway system uh, was built and the five freeway came in, uh, it demolished hundreds of homes, displaced uh, hundreds of families and uh, this effort is looking to not only increase park space with this uh, cap or lid but also provide for opportunities uh, for affordable housing development and to be creative and so i'm asking today uh, i do we do support the barrio Logan community plan and i want to take the moment uh, of privilege to thank uh, the planning group and specifically chairman uh, Steele, who i had the honor of uh, appointing as a first chair of the planning group when we created it about seven years ago. Um, but I asked, uh, and if you could reference the letter, hopefully you can get your hands on it. Um, it identifies the recreation element as the right location for a policy uh, to study and to support the future development of a freeway cap. Uh, it would not require any additional studies or any additional work. Uh, again, non-controversial issue. And uh, you can model this language after the Golden Hill community plan, which we approved uh, about five years ago, which also included language about freeway caps and freeway lids. And this would also tie in appropriately and nicely with the Southeastern plan, which we approved about six years ago, which actually already calls for uh, the potential of a freeway lid over the five freeway between the community of Logan Heights, which is in the Southeastern plan, uh, community planning area and Barrio Logan. So. Uh, I, I thank you for your time. Again, thank you uh, all the community members who worked really, really hard on this. I know that Julie was on the call. I wanna uh, thank her um, and everyone else for being so patient in what unfortunately take, took too long for the wrong reasons, but it uh, looks like it's gonna be a better product uh, and definitely will be with the inclusion of a recreation element to look at a freeway lid over the five freeway in Barrio Logan. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez, and thank you for all of your time and commitment to the city of Carl's, or, uh, San Diego. We totally appreciate that. Um, Keisha Javis-Jones. Good afternoon, Chairman Hoffman and commissioners. Thank you all very much for hearing our concerns today. My name is Keisha Javis-Jones. I'm the director of operations at Workshops for Warriors. Workshops for Warriors is not a manufacturing company. We are a nonprofit school that provides training to veterans that have served this great nation, and I just happen to be one of them. I served 10 years in the United States Marine Corps, and of those 10 years of being a Marine, I estimate that I spend four of those years training to become combat ready. Yet, the Department of Defense gave me five days to transition into the civilian workforce, and that's not enough. When you leave the military, you aren't just taking off the uniform. You're leaving your family that has supported you for years, all the benefits that came with that and the financial support that you've had during this time. Workshops for Warriors has changed this. It's created a learning community that provides training, the ability to earn nationalized credentials, certifications, and assist with the placement of our nation's veterans to obtain careers that they deserve in manufacturing. To date, we've trained over a thousand veterans with a 94% placement rate and they're retained in full-time jobs. But it's not just about training. We are about the entire person. We are about the entire community. We provide housing right here in Barrio Logan, live in stipends so that way they can pay their way within this community. We support the veterans and we support the Barrio Logan community. I've taken a part of many cleanups within this community. On the weekends, 
daily walking in, picking up trash off of the street, helping plan to cover up the graffiti, assisting with the safe removal of homeless in and around the area. We are not about the gates of this facility. We are about the community. When COVID hit, we started a community food bank that was assisting the community monthly. We handed out flyers. I have community members that call me or come up to these doors and ask for food and we never turn them away. Last year, I was standing on the corner of Main Street when a gunshot went off and the cameras of Workshops for Warriors assisted the police in detaining the individual that shot into another vehicle. We've been able to provide footages in many of these incidents to include break-ins, car accidents, and taggings. My role here at Workshops for Warriors every day is to make sure that we're making a difference and not just within the veteran population. I say again, it's about the community. We haven't heard anything in this plan about low emissions, but Workshops for Warriors and Vet Powered collectively have begun to start this effort. We have switched to electric vehicles. And as soon as available, we also plan to make sure all our industrial commercial grade vehicles will also become electric. Our school has a high capacity ventilation system that cleans and captures over 350 pounds of particle matter monthly. We again have made an effort to make sure we're going with zero emissions and we do care about the environment and the people surrounding this area. We do not pollute, we save lives. We provide competitive high wage careers for those that live right here. The current plan proposed jeopardizes the future of workshops for warriors. The veterans of San Diego and those currently employed by workshops for warriors and vet powered and those people live here. Elections within the Barrio Logan Planning Committee have not been held over two years. So how can we showcase our concerns? I respectfully request that Workshops for Warriors and Vet Power be exempt from this plan. We add a lot of value to this community. We respect the community and we should be exempt. Thank you very much, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, thank you, Keisha. And I just wanted to explain, uh, I did allow Keisha to go over her time allotment because Jenna Little had earlier seated her time. So um, thank you, Keisha. Uh, next is Derry Pence. Chairman Hoffman, thank you very much for this time. Um, I was a member of the group that put together the MOU and uh, I would just like to make one comment in regards to the request made by Mr. Dewey. While I highly respect the man, I believe that granting an exception to his uh, request would endanger the uh, transition zone in its entirety. The transition zone must be retained in its uh, entirety to ensure that there are no further requests to add housing in that area, to not only protect the residents, but to ensure that industry can continue to operate as it is today. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Sorry, I muted myself accidentally there. Thank you, Derry. Um, Bria Bohanan. And Bria, don't forget to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Chairman Hoffman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Once again, good afternoon, commissioners, Chairman Hoffman and Vice Chairman. My name is Bria Bohannon. I am a military veteran. I served four years in the Marine Corps and I am currently a welding student at Workshops for Warriors. I wanna take the time to speak on the positive impact that Workshops Warriors has had on my life. 
By the time of my graduation from this program, I will have numerous qualifications and certifications in welding. This will allow me to get a job anywhere in the nation to include Barrio Logan and San Diego County, San Diego County and I will have a direct impact on American infrastructure. I will also be able to help fill in the skilled labor gap in American manufacturing. Workshops for Warriors has provided me a housing stipend that helped me afford my rent between my time of leaving the military and receiving VA education benefits. Workshops for Warriors has had a tangible and intangible positive impact on my life, and I will have a lifelong career moving forward. I want to thank Workshops for Warriors and for you all for, uh, for their help, and thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, then we have Josephine Talamantes. Yes, hello, my name is Josephine Talamantes. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you, okay, Josephine, thank go you. right ahead. So my family has lived in Logan Heights since 1906 um, and primarily because it was a segregated community through 1954, we couldn't live anywhere else. We purchased our homes in hope of maintaining a place um, and, and holding on to the American dream. However, without a public process, the city after, the, after 1954 and between 1940 and the 60s allowed toxic businesses to come into our neighborhoods, which then caused a lot of health issues for our community. My mom, mother was a member of the planning group in the late 70s, early 80s, and she was sued um, after being a retired 50-year uh, worker at the canneries. She was sued by the industry because they didn't want to move the toxic businesses out. Um, unfortunately, uh, my mom eventually passed away uh, from other illnesses, but she also had breathing-related Ill illnesses as well. When the I-5 ca came in and California 75 came in uh, through eminent domain, we through eminent domain we lost 75 percent of our neighborhood. We went from 20,000 residents down to 15,000 residents. We then began, we took over Chicano Park and we began advocating for access to the Bay because when my family was here in the early 1900s, they had access to the Bay. No access to the Bay at the time. On the Coronado side, nice, beautiful coves, it can get into the water. Took us 17 years to get access to the Bay again. We support the planning document that is before you and, and we really, uh, really support the inclusion of the housing, it's not exactly what we want it, but it is good, a 15%, it's a little bit higher than the, than the city. We support the truck route um, and we support uh, the committees that are focusing on keeping our neighborhood safe. I was part of the MOU and the group that was negotiating for the buffer zone. And though I agree with uh, previous speaker, Barry, with regard to not changing the MOU, I did agree with David Douay because it's only one block and there is housing on the other side. And I do not think it would um, affect um, the housing or the MOU. I did not vote during the planning committee primarily because I did not want to affect the MOU. I do, I do support what David Alvarez is proposing with regard to a lid over the community. What I don't support is businesses that come into our community and then want to expand and then impact our neighborhood, especially our elderly residents. I, I truly believe in what the Workshop for Warriors does, but I do not like their process of not taking the neighborhood into consideration. I've heard all the testimony, it's beautiful, but we have elder residents that freak out every time they don't have access to good air or that their, their neighbors, their houses are being overcome by shadows because new buildings are being proposed. So I do support the plan. I do, I wanna thank the planning committee, especially Michael Prince and the others that worked with us very closely. And I hope that you will support the plan going forward. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, the next speaker has a call in number ending in 1620. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and when you begin, please state your full name. Good afternoon, Chairman Hoffman. My name is Seth Sepulveda. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. 
Uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak on behalf of Workshops for Warriors. I was originally intending to cede my time to Keisha Javis Jones, however, she already spoke. Uh, I would like to spend this time to personally uh, show my support for Workshops for Warriors. Um, as a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, alumni of Workshops for Warriors, and currently a lead welding instructor at Workshops for Warriors, I can say without a doubt, Workshops has positively impacted my life beyond the scope that I could have even imagine. Uh, I currently have emails from prior students continuously praising all of the staff we have here for simply saying, like, you've given us a future that we didn't even think we had or even opted out of. There, all of us have heard of the 22 Veterans Day and how much of an ongoing tragedy that is. I just wanted to say that Workshops for Warriors every single day strives to reach out and help every single veteran that we can. Thank you everyone for our time, or thank you everybody for my time. And uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Vieira. And Chris, please uh, unmute yourself. Chris, uh, just look for, there's a mute button below your screen to the left. Just un unmute that. Okay, Chris is having trouble unmuting and he uh, is our last speaker. So we'll give him just a couple of minutes uh, no, we have one more speaker. Okay, Chris, we're gonna let you figure out your speaking, uh, uh, your mute issue, and let's go with Richard Aguirre. Yes, hello, is Richard yes. Aguirre? Yes, Richard, we can hear you, go ahead. Hey, um. I just want to speak on behalf of Workshop for Warriors has helped me throughout the pandemic as a neighbor and employee. I have kept my job and continue to work during these hard times. They have helped the community stay clean and sometimes volunteer to clean other parts of Barrio Logan. We are always willing to help our community, neighbors, and we do cover up graffiti around Barrio Logan. We do clean up our, about, around Barrio Logan and we do this every morning. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim K. Jim, are you there? There is no microphone, period. Hello? There we go. Uh, oh, is this K Jim? Did I get that wrong? Uh, it's K Jim. Okay, thanks K, go, go right ahead. Okay, um, well, good morning. Um, my name is K Jim. I am currently a welding student here at Workshop for Warriors. So transitioning out of the Marine Corps can be very difficult due to unexpected problems such as financially, mentally, physically, um, end of commitments can be a very big inconvenience to the plans that we make and the goals that we did have. Workshop for Warriors has and is currently helping and supporting many veterans and civilians when times are rough and you're unsure of what you wanna do in life. Just having people who truly care to just listen can make the biggest difference in the world. They go above and beyond to help all those in need and that's a rare thing to come by. Personally, I am using a housing through Workshop for Warriors and 
plans that I had made had fell through and I would have been homeless and I wouldn't have been able to find a place to stay and finish my schooling here. But they had offered me the opportunity to live in an apartment here in this neighborhood so that I can continue my school and graduate. So I really appreciate everything that Workshop Warriors does for not just the veterans, but for the community and civilians. And thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Let's see, um, I see a couple hands raised, but they've already spoken. So I believe that concludes the public testimony portion. We'll close the public testimony. <laughs> Uh, and we'll go on. Um, I'm thinking it's time for a break. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at one, but I will tell you when we get back, uh, I would like, I know uh, Vice Chair Whalen has a conflict coming up and Jim, if you can stick around, we'll let you go first under planning commission discussion. At one, I unfortunately is when my meeting starts. All right, would the, would the commission be willing to let Jim make his comments before he leaves? Before yes. we can... I'll go yes. fast. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Okay, sorry, one of those things getting back from vacation. Uh, really quick, I know the area very well. For 34 years, I've, I've been there uh, to take my car for repair. And also I love the Latin world. Um, I will say that I'm very, very, pleased at how the stakeholders broke the stalemate on the, uh, the interface between industrial and residential. And I have to say, staff, you get better and better at these community plan updates, everyone we do. Wonderful job, it's just a, it's a great piece of work. Um, a couple of things that came to mind, uh, obviously the area could use some investment. Uh, the public market that was tried a few years ago failed and it was, likely because of a, a confluence of factors, but uh, uh, investment's good. The staff appears to have uh, addressed the gentrification issue. It's already having negative effects on the people who were there uh, in the early days with the art galleries and so on. But then we have a, a rare example of a truly walkable community here. This one is flat. And uh, I like the idea of, of letting it develop organically and providing the, uh, the buffer between the existing industrial and then the residential. And I think uh, as I leave, I, I would redirect people's view to slide 12 of the staff presentation, which showed the before and the after. It really tells the whole story. As far as the uh, requests for exemptions, um, it's always the tough part for, the, for us to decide, well, do we make exceptions for this? And I'll leave that for the rest of the group to decide how or if it should be done. But it, it looks like staff has done about as good a job as you could do to balance everything. And with that, I'll shut up. Okay, and uh, Jim, I take it you have to get to your meeting. So we will take a break, but um, you will be leaving at this point. Yeah, I have to chair the meeting at one, otherwise I blow it off. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, let's take a break. We'll go uh, just because it's kind of, I'd like uh, commissioners, uh, depending on how much discussion we have, is to grab something to eat, uh, if you can, snack or something. So we'll, we'll go till uh, 1.05. Or to the cloud. I'm sorry? Sorry. Oh, okay. Bye.
Sabrina, are you there?
Okay, we will begin as soon as I make sure all the commissioners are present. I think the only one I don't see is uh, Commissioner Otsuji. And while we're waiting, there he is. Um, very quick question for the uh, city attorney as we begin, we're back from break. Uh, a quick question from to the city attorney is we have five members. What is it a requirement that we will need four to, to um, move this item forward? And you're, you're muted, you're muted. There you go. I'm sorry. Yep. And I'm trying to deal with sun issues <laughs> on my face. You actually need five. Um, and so the rules actually say that if you are unable to get five, that you can postpone the item to when an, uh, the other members are available. So if for some reason you all are unable to get five votes today and you would like to continue the item to a different date um, when the vice chair can come back and participate in the vote, that is an option as well. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll strive for getting our votes today. We'll see how it goes. Through the um, chair, why are we required to have five votes and not four votes since that would be the majority of the appointed commission? It is part of your rules, your permanent rules of procedure. An affirmative vote is needed. Yes, out of five for these types of projects or plans. Is that for all legislative types? Yes. Okay, got it. That is correct. Okay, uh, now before we begin, we are going to be losing potentially our interpreters. And so I wanted to ask everyone who is in the audience right now listening, if you are relying on interpreters, would you please uh, press your raised hand? You don't need to speak, but just raise your hand so we can just see how many people would be affected if we lose our interpreter. Again, if you are relying on the interpreter, please uh, hit your, click on your raise hand icon. And I'm not seeing anybody. So I guess uh, we're okay, staff, if we need to lose the, uh, our interpreters, I think we're in good shape. Okay, we will go on to uh, Planning Commission comment. Uh, we're gonna work up this time from the bottom and let me get my list. I think uh, Commissioner Otsuji. You know, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt. I was just double checking and it's actually four affirmative votes. So your, your Commissioner Boomhauer is correct. It's not five for these legislative items. So four is fine. Okay, well, that makes it a little easier. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Never doubt another attorney. Okay. <laughs> You're muted. That's the first time I've ever seen an attorney muted. <laughs> Sorry, what I was saying was always doubt another attorney. <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Otsuchi, please. Go Thank ahead. you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, fortunate that we had to do this uh, with, for two rounds. But fortunately, uh, what we ended up with is uh, much better than the first round. So I really appreciate that. And, you know, let me just sit on a couple of the big factors uh, that I looked at on the first round and I'm looking at in the second round. I think it's so important, uh, you know, that the uh, historic, the art and culture uh, of Barrio Logan is preserved. And in this report, you can see it right at the forefront of this report of how they basically use that as the success 
to this community plan update. And, you know, I'm very happy to see that. And the makeup of the uh, planning group, along with the great participation uh, of the community, because I really wanted to hear uh, from the community of what they thought of what the draft plan that we will be voting on today uh, ended up being. <clears throat> he on a couple of uh, the other points, uh, the urban forest street trees, uh, the combined art and culture and the historic preservation uh, sections are great. And I wanna emphasize uh, the open space. Uh, there's three main areas that are basically gonna be interconnected when it's all said and done. And it starts uh, with the Choyas Creek area and it goes over to Chicano Park. And then at the end, it goes to the Cesar Chavez Park. And those are the three, to me, the three big areas that, that would be interconnected once all is said and done in regards to the planning aspect of it. And it is so important uh, that this be a major uh, backdrop for this community because I feel that this is going to basically frame and integrate the, the art and culture to start preservation uh, of this community more than anything else. And I'll give you a good example of what, what the street tree program would do uh, with uh, what they have outlined in the design guidelines that they have for this particular uh, project. Each tree that you will count in the community basically will take care of between anywhere from uh, 48 to 55 pounds of carbon each and every year. So it does make a huge difference. And it's, it's not a factor of cost of these trees because uh, you know it's a minimal cost in providing that and also maintaining it more than anything else. And one thing I would like to agree with uh, of what Mr. David Alvarez uh, recommended or suggests to us that we consider is uh, the lid over the freeway. That was already on my list, the things that I, would, I was gonna bring up. And I would like that to be considered uh, by this group if, it, if everybody is agreeable in regards to adding that uh, to this community plan update. I just wanted to get that out of the way, make sure I didn't forget about that. Um, another thing that I, I wanna emphasize is, if you look at the, this community plan update for Barrio Logan, this is not a, a, a large community and, and it works, I think it works for what this program entails. And I think we have to make sure that we identify that this is not a large scale infill project. It's more of a small scale infill project of what is existing there today. If you go visit there today, the thing that you will recognize at the very beginning is the art and culture. And I'm basically specifically pointing at the many murals and the art elements that they have in the community and what it does in regards to how it gives that character and color of that community. And I think it's so important that they not lose that in, in the community plan update as they progress more than anything else. And the history, the, the history of this community is something unique to it. You know, it, 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 it ended up being very small, but at the very beginning, it was identified as Logan Heights and it was pretty big. And then came uh, the 15 and the five and everything else that divided this up. But I think those neighborhoods uh, uh, that are adjacent to it uh, have a strong effect uh, in the short and long term of the success uh, of the Body of Logan uh, community plan update. And one of the things is that, you know, we tried to soften 
the impact of the Interstate 5 more than anything else and have it go beyond uh, uh, the body of Logan uh, boundaries. And I think that's gonna be doable based upon the community plan updates that we have in the surrounding areas. So I'm gonna be very supportive uh, of the, this community plan update and also uh, would like for the rest of the uh, commission to consider adding uh, the lid to Interstate 5 as a uh, additional item to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before we go on, actually, I got off stride a little bit. I had a couple of questions for the staff. That was one of them. Staff, could you comment on the, just for, for our purposes of discussion, uh, the lid concept as far as, um, does staff see issues with that? Is there regulatory mechanisms sure. that can be adopted? Sure, um, Chairman Hoffman, I can answer that. Yes, that's, I, that's something that we can support. Um, adding that as we move forward to city council with the plan. Great, appreciate oh, it. Can just add excuse me, really, Chairman. Excuse me, Chairman Hall. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi, if I could just add to that. Um, we also have policies in our parks master plan that are supportive of these policies. Um, so our team will look in um, to incorporating those as we move forward to council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Commissioner Otsuji, I didn't mean to- Yes, I forgot, I forgot. Two other things. Uh, sure. to me that, uh, the second one was that I would like uh, consideration uh, from the port. It would be the Port of San Diego in regards to uh, Cesar Chavez Park. I would like some indication of how they would be addressing future renovations of that park related to the community plan update. And also uh, from the port of what they will be looking at in the future along the boundaries of their property, the Barrio Logan. And lastly, also try to get an indication from the, the Navy of what their intentions are along the boundaries that border uh, Body or Logan, if that's all possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Modane. Um, I think it's a really good plan. Uh, you've got two very um, opposing industries and we've got needs in, in both of them. Um, so I think this is a good, um, blend of, of those um, challenges. I think staff did a really, really great job on this. Um, I specifically like the truck routes. I know that's important to the community. And um, I think that's a fantastic idea to put in here. I did want to know, is are there hours um, correlated to the truck routes? Because I saw mention of that in public comment, but I didn't see that specifically in the staff report. So can I get clarity on that? The community plan does not uh, establish hours or uh, provisions. Um, any enforcement of the restrictions would be done by the police department. Okay. Um, I agree with Commissioner Osuji's comments on open space and culture preservation. I think it's really critical um, and it's something that I value in, in the city, uh, the art and, and the culture of Barrio Logan. Um, I, I did want to address um, New Leaf's concerns um, about um, expansion and didn't know if staff had any kind of idea of ways to allow expansion for businesses beyond the 20% that actually positively contribute to our climate action plan, if that's something that we could um, look at. So the New Leaf's request for exemption or the ability to expand was reviewed and discussed with the planning group and with staff over the development of the uh, plan update in um, the winter and spring of this year, uh, the community and staff uh, uh, proposed moving forward with the plan that implements the recommendations of the MOU, 
uh, and the changes to land use that would not allow for new or expansion of industrial uses beyond what's allowed per the previously conforming regulations. Uh, New Leaf is an industrial business and an industrial use going forward is not allowed within this particular area. I would also highlight just briefly that the 2013 community plan also identified this block as, or this, this segment of the community as allowing for neighborhood commercial use and did not allow for at least proposing new industrial within this segment. Understanding that the previously conforming regulations do apply and the provisions could allow up to 20% and would be evaluated um, on a case by case basis as part of future future project submittal. Got it. Um, and other than that, uh, I think it's a, a really comprehensive plan and I applaud staff for this. Um, and you had a lot of work ahead of you to get consensus and good job. So I'm supportive of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Malbro. And uh, Commissioner, you're muted. Sorry, I think I'm a little tired. As <laughs> usual, um, I want to thank staff. This is they've done a tremendous job uh, in this process, especially in the outreach of it. But I also want to give my a tremendous thanks to um, Barrio Logan CPG and the Environmental Health Coalition, and of course the Ship of Builders and Repair Industry for coming up with that MOU. That was big. That was major to make this happen. And I know that wasn't easy to do, uh, but you made a big difference. Um, I'll tell you what, I, I grew up off of 37th and National, or 36th and, and National Avenue, and not very far from Barrio Logan. And uh, the one thing, and I've been there very much, and I still go there every once in a while. And the one thing that I've always valued with this area is their attention to maintaining their culture whether it's from the arts, the people, even the low riders. I mean, it's just amazing how they do that. They're very proud of their neighborhood uh, and they got engaged with this and they've done a great job. There's this has so much possibility uh, with this. And I, I also wanna support uh, the freeway cap. I think it's a great idea. And lastly, I'm a bit jealous. I uh, had a chance to do uh, a community plan up, uh, update in the encamp area in 2016. And I, I wish I had thought about some of these things uh, like the anti-displacement efforts, because I know people in my community was very concerned about that too. And you listened to them, uh, staff, and, and you came up with some great ideas. So of course I'm, I'm supporting this as it is. Thank you. Oh, excuse me along with adding the uh, uh, freeway cap, sorry. Okay. Um, Commissioner Malbro, would you like to make a motion just to get things started? I would love to do that. Uh, okay. I would like to make a motion that we uh, approve this community update and pass it on to the city, uh, city council, along with adding the freeway cap. I hope that covers that. Second. Oh. Uh, second by Commissioner Boomhauer. Okay, uh, we have a motion to approve the staff recommendation with the addition of the freeway cap, freeway lid, um, seconded by Boomhauer. Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you. Um, so a couple of general comments. First of all, I, I really think, I, I know that this was uh, community planning through fits and starts and um, we don't want to replicate this process elsewhere. However, I really, really, really think that um, the planning department should look at this community, the, out, the community outreach that ended up being done as part of this process and the way that they incorporated feedback from all corners of the community and not just from the community planning group and uh, a designated subcommittee for the community plan update. Uh, as the model and not the exception uh, for how community outreach is done. I, I think that one of the reasons why we are all going to be so supportive of this plan is because staff really, really did their homework and really did the work required to get the, <clears throat> the community's input, not just from the people that show up at the meetings or, or that might engage with the online tool, but, but to really be 
with the community where they are. And I, th I think that should be the way that it's done every single time. Um, I really also appreciate staff's effort to in greatly increase the amount of potential housing. Um, this is a transit oriented neighborhood. It's close to urban employment areas. And, and so it's an ideal place for, for adding um, housing. And so the fact that this plan accommodates up to 4,000 housing units is, is great. And I wanna emphasize and reiterate my comments from the last planning commission workshop back in February, commending the stakeholder groups for working together and coming up with this plan. That um, re really was the only way forward. And it, it shows a lot that everybody was willing to give a little bit and work together to come up with something that I think we can all agree is, is better than the plan that, that failed the first time. I have some specific comments on this um, and, and would actually um, perhaps suggest a friendly motion or, or a friendly amendment to the motion that's on the floor. Um, and, and these very much relate, I've, I've made these points before and I, I wanna emphasize again that these are specific to this community plan, but also I think it's something that planning staff should be looking at for every community plan going forward. Um, specifically, if you look at page 48 of the community plan and the mobility element, uh, mobility element item six or goal, or I'm sorry, eight, um, specifically policy 3.2.10, implement transit priority measures as queue jumpers and such as queue jumpers and transit priority signal operations where feasible to allow transit to bypass congestion and result in faster transit travel times at critical locations. If we leave the language as is with the where feasible included, then what it does is it allows the city's transportation and traffic engineers to decide to prioritize vehicular traffic over other right-of-way users. And so I think we should eliminate where it says where feasible and just simply say, this is the policy. And that's gonna be consistent with my comment on mobility element 14 on page 54, uh, where it talks about separated bikeways um, should be installed where feasible. Uh, again, Separated bikeways should be installed, period. That should be the policy. And if we need an exception to that, then it should be on staff to show why there's a reason it can't happen. Further on page 59 in section 3.6, parking in the mobility element, uh, policy 3.6.6 encourages repurposing of on-street parking for alternative uses where appropriate and feasible. And again, I think that we should strike that where appropriate and leave the where appropriate, but leave out the and feasible, because again, that just gives too much discretion to prioritize vehicular users over other right of way users. And then finally on page 60 uh, in section 3.7, good movement and freight circulation element, um, policy 3.7.5, which is discouraging the streets, uh, trucks from using local streets, there's language in here that says measures to minimize conflicts between trucks, residential needs, computer access, commuter access, and other users of community and neighborhood roadways could include but not be limited to implementation of traffic calming measures such as speed homes, diverter islands, or other treatments where appropriate and feasible. And again, especially when the next bullet emphasizes making changes to designated truck routes to make them more attractive to truck traffic, we really should be pushing to include these other measures to make these streets that we want to divert truck traffic away from to be less attractive. And so I think, again, sitting there and, and leaving in the where feasible language just gives too much discretion to staff in a review of a, of a later project to decide to prioritize vehicular traffic over other right-of-way users. So I would like to suggest a friendly amendment to Commissioner Marble's motion to support with the freeway lid language, but also eliminating uh, the where feasible language in these particular sections. I'll accept that for a new moment. Okay. And as chair, as the seconder, I obviously support that. Sure, sure. I got that. So those conclude my comments. Again, staff, great job. Community, great job with this. I think it's a great community plan.
Okay, thank you. Okay, we've amended the motion to to add those. We might, uh, when we take the vote, Commissioner Boomhauer might have you go through those one more time. Um, so I'll start with my comments, and I apologize to everyone for the time, but I think it was time well spent. Um, and I'm going to get on a soapbox, maybe a little bit, but try not to too much. But th this this is the most unique community plan that that's in San Diego. It deals, it's dealing with issues that most communities just don't have to. It's been a community that for years, that its issues have been swept under the carpet. Issues of affordability, gentrification, retention of community culture, environmental justice, and the hazards that this community has to deal with that no other communities really do. The lack of coherent land use planning, citywide votes to overturn uh, their, their general plan, not supported by the community, but not by a citizen citywide vote. So this community has really faced a lot of barriers. So for that reason, th this plan uh, really uh, has come a long way, this community, and I just can't overstate what's been stated is the, the, the work of the collaboration between all of the stakeholders here, uh, led by a terrific staff to, to be able to do that. I really believe this community was on the brink up until this effort started. So, so really my hat's off to all of the collaborators uh, who made this what it is today. Uh, the, but I will say that there's a long way to go. It's the implementation of these policies and goals of this plan over the long haul that'll either make or break this community. The city's decision makers, the port district, the Navy, the stakeholders, the community and the industrial stakeholders, they'll all need to make a concerted effort to turn this community into what it deserves to be. And I'm very helpful it will happen, but I still see a long road ahead, but we've now got a base that, that's and a foundation that's really, really solid. Um, some specific issues and questions I have, um, Inclusionary housing, I wanna start off by saying that I, I love the fact that we've finally done, it's the first community that I'm aware of that I've worked on a community plan where we've actually uh, put in inclusionary housing requirements. And in this case at, at 15%, I, I think that is so important. Uh, one concern I have, um, but I think this is probably my overreaching, but I would like to hear staff's uh, response to it. Um, there's a lot of smaller lots here, and there's going to be a lot of uh, redevelopment because these, as we've noted, the homes are very, very old. Um, so a lot of these projects are going to be um, raised and, and rebuilt, but on many small lots. And my concern is that there's going to be so many 10 or less unit projects that are going to get through and, and we won't get the inclusionary housing that we were hoping to get. Uh, and so my thought was, and I can tell you some other city examples, is what if we lowered that number down to seven? It wouldn't catch everyone, but it would certainly get the vast majority. Uh, but if we round up, which uh, section 143.0720N uh, says in the affordable housing section of the code that you round up, that I'd say two units for a seven unit project is too much. Uh, so maybe between 10 and seven, uh, you just need one unit, you round down. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there and I, I, I'd like to hear maybe there's real problems with that, but I think getting more inclusionary housing in this community is really critical to get that affordable housing number up. So that's just a thought. Now I'll let you respond to that after um, I finish here. Uh, Wanted to ask workshop for warriors. A uh, question I have for staff is, uh, I, I believe I understand the issue, but is there not a grandfather clause that is being invoked here where, what is happening to them if this gets adopted? Uh, so let me start, I'll stop there. That's really all my comments, but if you could answer that first question is, uh, what's in store for workshop for warriors if, this amendment uh, or if this uh, community plan is adopted as is. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The workshop for warriors similar to New Leaf would be subject to the previously conforming um, regulations of the Land Development Code. Uh, I am aware that they are that they have a uh, development project submittal to expand their operations. Um, and that project uh, was deemed complete and is subject to the regulations of the current community plan and the associated plan district ordinance. If they were to move forward with the entitlements associated with that action, um, they could proceed and would then be subject to the previously conforming regulations. So that is the answer there. Okay, so there, there's definitely an avenue for them. Correct. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just your thoughts on the, the affordable housing. It, again, I'm, I'm just more worried about people uh, developing. A lot of project will be 10 units or less. Um, if that number could be lowered, is, is there an issue with that? And Chairman Altman, that's I think something at this point we'd have to just take back and, and, and consider it. Um, it's probably something I'm not really able to at this point um to give you more of a definitive answer just other than we'll have to look at it okay now i, I appreciate that and i didn't mean to spring that on you at all um and it's not going to certainly affect my vote but if that's something you could look at and see if there's merit or not I, i'd appreciate that um commissioner hoffman can i just want to make another comment and just ask uh Lisa Lynn, if she could address, um, we, we had some staff look at this a little bit more, um, the current recreation element as it relates to uh, the potential for a freeway lid or um, widening of freeway bridges. If Lisa, can you address that please? Yes, thank you, Steve. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so we wanted to um, bring to your attention that the draft community plan um, already includes a policy that we think would provide the level of support that you're looking for, but if it doesn't, I guess that's where we would ask for clarification. Um, but it is in the recreation element. It's policy um, um, 7.1.18, and it calls for pursuing opportunities to provide open and recreational spaces on freeway decks covering I-5 or expanded bridges spanning I-5. Okay, um, I don't know if there's any comment on that, but uh, I guess the, the vision that, uh, that David Alvarez uh, mentioned is the goal. And, and I think that's what we kind of attach to is, does that, does that provide for that? Do, do we really need to do anything then? I think in I general, think we can support the um, concepts going forward, Tate. Yeah, thank you. I was going to say we can look at the policy that uh, Mr. Alvarez had mentioned as it relates to Golden Hill and make sure that that is also covered in the um, proposed policy in the plan right now and then um, look in our um, figures that as it displays uh, potential recreation and park areas and see if we can also uh, potentially uh, match the locations that are in the southeastern San Diego plan so there's cohesion between the two. Okay, and the other uh, comment that came up um, as I go back over my notes uh, was Mr. Mr. Dooley, who was a no vote on the committee of, and asking for the uh, residents uh, for a mixed use, more of employee workspace above, uh, above residential above. Uh, I, I'm just going to see if there's any commissioners uh, who are interested in discussing that. Just I didn't want to let that go by. And okay. If I could jump in quickly here. Uh, Please. Um, regarding your question about the threshold to trigger the inclusionary requirement, um, the, we've been basing our recommendations with regard to the inclusionary data and um, the need for uh, assistance for um, households being displaced on the housing and economic or socioeconomic study that was prepared um, by Kaiser Marston Associates. That study did look overall at the, the number of uh, non-deed restricted affordable housing units in the community, but did not analyze 
the number of sites um, that would fall above or below a particular threshold in terms of our projections for future uh, development. So that is something that we uh, could look into. Uh, we could probably look to our, our future land use projections on that, but it's not data that we currently have available. Okay, and I'll also I'd ask if you look into it and if it makes sense to you staff, then uh, please consider it, but and I appreciate that. Okay, uh, with that, if there's no other comments, um, we have a motion on the floor and that motion is to support the staff recommendation. Um, I, I think maybe, maybe we don't need to make part of the motion is to add the lid because it sounds like that's being covered uh, and staff will look into that and knows our wishes on that um, and we'll incorporate whatever wording is appropriate. Uh, but Chair, or, uh, Commissioner Boomhauer, could you go through your points one more time to make sure we're all clear on that? Sure. It's uh, in policy 3.2.10, policy 3.5.6, policy 3.6.6, .6, and policy 3.7.5 to eliminate the word where, words where feasible from those policies. Okay, thank you. All right, then that is that has been made part of the motion. So let's go through a vote. Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Malbro. Aye. Commissioner Modane. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. And Vice Chair Whalen has had to leave early. Chairman Hoffman is an aye, so it passes by a 5-0 vote. And again, staff, uh, great, great job, as we've all said. So, But don't let it go to your heads too much. We've got another community plan coming up. So, Thank you, commissioners. Okay, with that, uh, Tim, tell me differently, but I believe that does it. That completes today's agenda. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out so long.